This is a strange one. A little over a year ago, back in 2018, in the Grand Teton National Park, I had an encounter with a creature that I simply cannot identify. I have searched and scoured online and have not found anything that resembles the being that I saw. I try not to speak of this often, as I fear I will be thought of as a loon. During the summer of 2018, I was working for the National Park Service in the Grand Teton National Park, specifically in the Inner Lakes District. This was my first year in the position, and I was assigned to work at a campground on Blacktail Butt, just outside the main park. I was busy closing the campground, with two other co-workers alongside me. As I was counting the money from the evening before, I heard a very distinct but strange, unmistakable howl coming from the west of the campground. The sound seemed to be coming from the base of the mountain, the campground was located at the base of Blacktail Butt, a small mountain just on the outskirts of the park. From my location, I could see that the sound was coming from the direction of the mountain. There were three other campgrounds located near the mountain, so I could observe all the other campers and employees in the area. For the most part, there were no campers with their dogs in their campsites, so that possibility was checked off nor were there any visible dogs in the area. I was trying to determine what this howl was, or if maybe there was a wolf. But the howl was unlike that of a coyote or a wolf. It was very different, difficult to describe. It was similar to the recording of Bigfoot calls that you can hear online. Off the top of my head, I want to say there are the Ohio calls you can look up. I'm sure it's on YouTube, as is everything nowadays. I continued to listen, and as I did, all the other rangers in the area seemed to listen as well. I began asking my co-workers if they had heard the sound, but apparently, nobody had heard it from their location. I felt silly, so I kept my mouth shut. After a few moments, I heard another howl, similar, but not exactly the same, coming from the same location. I have never heard a coyote or a wolf make a sound like this. It's hard to describe, really. It was then that I realized that none of the other rangers were acknowledging the sounds. They acted strange, nervous, and quick-eyed. It felt as though they had heard it, but were choosing not to say anything. What did they know that I did not? Just as I was almost ready to pack up and leave, I heard a co-worker on the radio. He was calling for a minute. As I was leaving, I could see a person walking in the area of the howls. They were staying in the tree line, but moving steadily up the mountain. I got closer and asked my co-worker if he had seen anybody in the area. He told me that he, too, had been walking around and patrolling the area. I informed him of the sounds I had heard. I wasn't sure what they were, but they were coming from the back part of the campground. He got nervous almost instantly, the second I brought it up. He got close to me and whispered in my ear that he's pretty sure he saw a tall, dark figure moving around on the back section of the park. He said he didn't get a good look at them and claimed he did not want to. He felt an immediate sense of danger and fear. As he spoke to me, I could tell from his voice and body language that he was genuinely concerned. I drove a little bit further, trying to see what it was that he saw. He had told me it was on the back section of the park, and that's exactly where I went. After a while, I'm pretty sure I saw what he saw because what I saw was approximately seven feet tall and had the same dark color. I tried to get a better look at it, but I could tell it was right near the edge of the tree line. It had already moved into the tree line, coming from a large meadow. I even told my other rangers about it, but they would not speak to me about it. In fact, one told me to stop talking about it if I knew what was good for me. This particular ranger has not spoken to me since and refuses to. After I saw this thing enter the tree line, I decided not to follow it. 
Another thing to keep in mind is that it was pouring down rain during this time, and even then, the ground was hard. There should have been tracks. I went back later to look, but I did not find any, especially in the wet portion of the grass where I saw this thing enter the tree line. It was very strange how I did not find any tracks at all, be it boot prints or animal tracks. After returning to the office, I kept hearing the howls again, almost all night. This time, there were multiples, one coming from the north end of the campground and the other from the east. My belief is that there were two of these creatures communicating back and forth with each other. So now, if I ever hear or experience anything strange, I don't really talk about it with my colleagues. For whatever reason, they seem hell-bent on keeping everything a big secret or conspiracy. I'm not really sure why, but they refuse to talk about it. Perhaps the refusal to acknowledge the existence of these creatures helps them cope with day-to-day -day life. But for me, I'm trying to get to the bottom of it. Lastly, I would like to assure you that what I saw was simply not a person. Nor was it a person in a costume, because what I saw could not be explained as such. The proportions were so off and distorted that it would not make sense. The movement alone was different. I also apologize in advance for not having the most descriptive story and account, but you get what you get. Thank you greatly for taking the time to listen to my story. So I used to live in this small one-story house with a, at the time, pseudo-large family. Three kids, me included, and my mom. So the house had this added on living room. It was a recent addition to the house that I guess the original owner decades ago didn't want, but was added after he passed. Now I am not superstitious or anything. But that whole room felt... off. Like it was uneven and slanted even though it wasn't. It gave me the chills to be alone there. One night I leave my room for some reason, probably because I was scared or something, and I slept on the couch in the living room because it is in eyeshot of my mother's room and very close to it. We also had this mirror. It was a large vanity mirror on rusty hinges that would move when hit by wind or a very strong current since it was made of copper and rather large. So I'm sleeping in the living room, or trying to, and then the mirror starts to move. Now it is stagnant in there, like no air current. The heaters aren't blowing. Nothing. And this big-ass copper mirror rotates and faces me while I am on the couch. It turned real slow, too. It squeaked and everything and bothered the hell out of me. It lasted an eternity. Couldn't sleep all night and laid awake facing away from it. The following morning when I got up and walked over to my mom's room to wake her up, the mirror was silently turned back to its original position. I don't believe it was anything supernatural, but it freaks me the F out to this day and I'm glad I never have to set foot in that room again. Every person that has ever been close to me has seen or had a conversation with me when I wasn't around at least once. This started happening around the time I turned 13. I had an early day at school and decided to hang out at a friend's house instead of catching the bus home, stayed for a few hours and walked home. When I got into the house I heard my mom speaking to someone upstairs, which was unusual since we were normally the only two people there at any given time. When I turned the corner to see what was going on, I saw her looking into the open door of my room and heard her having a conversation. Obviously confused, I asked who was over, at which point she jumped, turned around, and got white in the face. At the time, she told me she was on the phone, but later confessed that she thought I had been home since school got out, 
and was trying to wake me up from a nap. A few years later, I got into my first serious relationship. After a few months of dating each other, I had moved into my first apartment with a few close friends. One night while she was staying over, I was awoken and saw that she was crying. When I asked her what was wrong, she told me that she had gotten up to use the bathroom. When she came out, she saw me walking down the hallway and towards the stairs. Assuming I had just woken up from her getting out of bed and went to get a glass of water, she didn't think anything of it. Until she turned the corner and saw me laying in the same spot, I was in completely asleep. Not long after that, my roommates also started having similar experiences, usually at night. This has since continued throughout every relationship and close friendship I've acquired, to the point where it's become something that I have to disclose while also trying to sound sane. The most troubling and confusing part about this is that I've never personally experienced it, and the only time I'm aware that it's happened is when I'm comforting someone from whatever they saw. This happened in the middle of nowhere, Missouri, at our house, and it has two parts. I'm not sure the two parts are related, but I've always thought that they were. First part is that I'm 16 and I get home from school, and there are two guys sitting on my porch. Keep in mind, I'm in the middle of nowhere, so they see me, and I see them, and it's not like I can turn around. So being 16, I get out and go talk to them. Turns out they are basically bums or hobos that live on the rails. Funny thing is that they are at least 10 miles from the rails, and I have no idea how they picked out my house from the dozens they passed. Anyway, I start talking to them, and one is a larger guy with a beard that is doing all the talking and giving me the full-on, oh, I'm down on my luck story. The skinny guy was not saying a word and kind of on reflection acting drugged up. They want me to give them a ride to the YMCA, which is about 25 miles away. Being 16, I think. Why not? About that time, my mother comes home and freaks out. Calls the sheriff and he comes and picks them up. Doesn't arrest them, just has them transported to a shelter. I talked to the sheriff later, and he says that he ended up taking them to the YMCA for the night. No big deal. Then it gets a little weird, and this is when I've always wondered the connection. My mother goes out of town to stay with her sister for the weekend. Not a huge deal. I was 16 at the time, and it happened every few months. About 1 a.m., I start hearing a noise downstairs. Not loud enough to wake me up and make me say, holy shit, someone is breaking in, but loud enough to wake me. This goes on for about 20 minutes or so, and I'm finally awake. I turn on all the lights, but don't go outside. At this point, I'm about half freaking out. The noises aren't loud enough that I think something is wrong, but they were loud enough to make me go. WTF. Nothing happens about 45 minutes later I go to bed, but have opened the blinds and looked outside. I'm laying in bed again thinking to myself, well, I didn't see anything it sure was dark out there, and I realize, hey man, you have a giant ass overhead street light on an electric pole outside that is always on. Why is it dark? This prompts me to freak the hell out. I get up, and of course load up a shotgun, grab a few cans of Dr. Pepper and stay up all night while staring into the darkness because sure as shit my giant street lamp that has been on every day for 16 years is dead. Morning rolls around and there is that dew that covers the ground. I go outside and first look at the light, and the fuse was pulled laying on the ground. It was one of those old fuses that looked like a shotgun shell. I put it back in, and it worked the next night. I walk up to the house, and in the morning dew there are all these handprints on the door, as well as all these pentagrams drawn on the door. 
What freaked me out was that there was all this paint gone and chips around the screen or glass door. Like someone had a small screwdriver and was trying to get in. Scared the crap out of me. And the police decided that it was just someone screwing with me or it was random. I've always thought that the two hobos came back. But keep in mind if they did, they would have had to make it 25 miles. So at that point I have no idea what they were planning. Also my mother thought I was making the whole thing up. She thought I was doing a practical joke and couldn't figure out the punchline. She stayed at the sister's house. I was running along a trail in the woods behind a park and decided to go farther than I had in the past. So I was running along and there was this old, beaten stuffed animal sitting alongside the path. Kind of weird, but I kept going. A little farther along the path, there was a weathered doll sitting on a stump. They weren't super visible, but enough to catch your eye as you went past. I kept running and then turn a corner to see a couple dozen stuffed animals and dolls stabbed to and hanging from the trees. Safe to say I promptly turned around. I was backpacking the river to river trail alone and was staying the night at one horse gap in Shawnee Forest. I set up my campsite and did a little exploring around the area walking along a cliff edge. I came back, started a fire, and ate some crappy freeze-dried meal. It's almost ten and I'm looking at the stars and I hear from the area. I was exploring earlier this loud animal noise. It sounded like a monkey howling. I'm not an expert in animal sounds, but I do know most of the sounds in that area since I hiked them quite frequently, and I had no idea what it was. I went into my tent shortly after and started to go to sleep when I heard, probably within 100 feet of my tent, a sound like a single big footstep. No worries, probably a deer. Then I heard it again a few minutes later and again a few minutes later. Then I heard several steps back to back getting closer. My mind was racing what it could be, but since I was alone, I was prone to freak out a little more. So I just told myself to calm down, it's just a deer. Then I hear the noise of something dropping on the rock I'm camping on. I'm on the side of a small cliff and the tree line is about 10 feet away. Then I hear it again. It sounded like rock hitting rock, like the rocks were getting thrown at me. It happened a few more times, and then one hit my tent. At that moment, I'm convinced it's a Samsquanch. I peek out the netting at the top of my tent and scream as loud as I can, Hey! After that, I didn't hear anything, rocks or footsteps, and I just wanted to go to sleep so I wouldn't freak out anymore. I told myself it just had to be acorns falling from the trees and eventually got to sleep. So the next morning I got out of my tent and inspected the ground. There are no acorns or pine cones or anything but rocks on the ground. I'm still telling myself it couldn't have been the rocks because they would have to have been thrown. But I pick up a rock, throw it in the air and let it hit. And it was the exact same noise I heard the night before. I packed it up and noped out of there. I'll never forget that day at work when my co-workers and I found ourselves discussing paranormal experiences. It had been an unusually slow day at the deli with hardly any customers, so we decided to share some spooky stories to pass the time. One of the deli workers had a particularly chilling story to tell. He recounted an incident that had taken place about a year back when he and several friends were having a BBQ and decided to spend the night at his house. The way he told the story made my spine tingle with anticipation. 
According to him, they were all gathered on the back porch, just enjoying each other's company and talking late into the night. Everything seemed perfectly ordinary until, out of nowhere, one of his friends let out a startled yell and pointed towards the tree line. All eyes turned to where his friend was pointing, and there, standing by a tree, they saw what appeared to be a human figure. The atmosphere on the porch suddenly shifted, and a sense of unease settled over the group. They were all frozen in place, trying to make sense of what they were seeing. But the terror didn't end there. In a matter of seconds, the human figure seemed to transform into a canine shape right before their eyes. The creature vanished into the woods, leaving the group dumbfounded and shaken. The deli worker who had shared the story swore that none of them were drunk or under the influence of any substances. They didn't want to behave recklessly around the children who were also present at the gathering. As I listened to his story, I couldn't help but feel a mixture of fear and fascination. It sounded like something straight out of a horror movie. I could only imagine the fear and confusion they must have experienced at that moment. After hearing this tale, the curiosity in our group grew and we couldn't help but wonder what they had encountered that fateful night. Was it a trick of the light, an optical illusion, or something more supernatural? We couldn't say for sure, but one thing was certain. There was something eerie and unexplainable lurking in those woods. As the day at the deli continued, we often found ourselves glancing towards the tree line half expecting to catch a glimpse of the enigmatic figure ourselves. The deli worker's story left a lasting impression on all of us, and we were left with the haunting question what could possibly take on the form of both a human and a canine. The mystery remained unsolved, and we could only wonder if there were more secrets hidden in the darkness of that forest, waiting to be discovered by unsuspecting eyes. We were investigating a campsite surrounded by blood and lots of reported Bigfoot activity. As we were patrolling the area on the lookout for any suspicious activity, we heard something heavy crawling through the brush, breaking branches as it moved. It stopped once we turned off our lights, and we could hear something right beside us. It was breathing very heavily, making strange noises, and suddenly we see this large dark shape jumping right between my partner and me. Before turning around to face us, it was at least eight feet tall, about five feet wide, and had yellow glowing eyes in the darkness. It stared us down intensely for a moment before turning and running off into the woods after it realized it had been spotted. I don't think it expected us to be there, we searched for footprints or anything else beyond being completely terrified about what we had just seen, but we knew our job meant that we had to follow it and find out who or what it was. My partner and I just kept looking at each other in disbelief after seeing what a creature this was. Clearly, there was nothing about this that was human in any way, shape, or form. The strange part, though, is that even though we did report this incident to our higher-ups, they didn't seem the least bit concerned. They talked as if they knew something but weren't going to tell us. Anyway, if you manage to get your hands on any sort of Bigfoot encounters or stories, I would love to read them and try to educate myself on what it is that we saw. And don't get me wrong, my partner and I were completely horrified by this still am. It's still rough to talk about, but I figured I have to at least come to terms with it. We're very lucky that this large animal didn't attack us and kill us. Eight years ago, I found myself in Bend, Oregon, a place that seemed to harbor whispers of the unknown. 
As I explored the charming town, I stumbled upon an intriguing tale that would ignite my curiosity and lead me on an adventure I could never have imagined. I had the chance to strike up a conversation with a lady who had camped near Paulina Peak, a majestic peak that stood tall at 7,897 feet. The thought of camping amidst such breathtaking scenery excited me, but it was her story that truly captured my attention. She recounted a night, eight years prior, when her peaceful camping trip took an unexpected turn. In the early morning hours, a blood-curdling scream echoed through the wilderness. The sound was like nothing she had ever heard before, and it sent shivers down her spine. Frightened and perplexed, she decided to share her experience with the local forest service rangers from the Deschutes National Forest. The rangers were attentive as she described the terrifying scream she had heard. They revealed to her a plaster cast of a Bigfoot track, left by a creature that had been spotted crossing a road by two of the rangers themselves. With conviction, they assured her that the scream she heard was probably from the very creature that left that intriguing track. Intrigued and captivated, I was eager to learn more about this mysterious encounter. I sought to track down the retired ranger who had witnessed the Bigfoot track, hoping to hear more about this enigmatic creature roaming the woods of Oregon. However, my efforts to follow this lead were met with obstacles. The Forest Service personnel seemed tight-lipped, unwilling to share any further information. So basically, I was with a group of friends walking from one condominium to another. There was a forest between these condominiums, with a fence dividing it from the sidewalk. I was behind the group with one of my friends. We were walking through a slighty dark part of the street, and suddenly both us saw some some white thing in one of the trees. It looked like a slime, and it was moving in a really weird way. Had no legs, no face and it was a really powerful white, like there's no chance it was a light or something else. I called for the other guys, and as I shouted, it started climbing really fast in a really bizarre way as if I scared it. I turned on the lights from the phone to see if I could find it, but honestly I was scared too and my heart started beating fast, so I just started running away with my friend. It was so good to have him there, because we talked later and both of us saw the same thing and even complimented each other as we talked. So I was sure I was not hallucinating. Of course, none of our friends who were in front of us believed in what we said. Some of them got intrigued, but I wouldn't blame them for not believing it, as I wouldn't blame you. It was really strange. It was like that venom slime, but white. It's my only encounter with something that I just can't explain what it was. It really looked like it was not from Earth. My husband bought me a voodoo doll a couple birthdays ago in New Orleans. It was a vampire to keep you safe at night. I thought it was cute, but I did not put too much stock in it being real. Anyway, fast forward to a couple weeks ago. For some backstory, my husband was a boy scout. He has no fear of the wilderness and is strictly a don't worry until you have to person. We had been camping for several days at this point, so I was not spooked either. It was a very normal, happy night. When we arrived at this campsite, I got the idea to grab our vampire. We normally keep him hanging in our car. He would not budge. I'm talking my husband and I both tried to get this clip to open for a good ten minutes, and it just wouldn't. We thought maybe it had melted together in the heat. Joke that he needs to stay in the car for some reason we are unaware of and we went about our day. Fast forward several hours. We are in our tent at Sipsy Wilderness with our kids just hanging out after they went to sleep. 
With no prompt, no scary rustling in the bushes, no bad feeling, nothing. I get the urge to ask my husband if he's scared. I suddenly feel my hair standing up. He says, yes. Without even talking to each other about what we should do, we both instantly grabbed the kids and ran for what felt like our lives to the car. Tossed the still sleeping kids in the back seat, my husband buckling them in the car as I'm driving away. I'm big on car seat safety, but I didn't even wait. I just had a feeling we had seconds to get out of there. We didn't even get a chance to discuss what was going on when a random car passes us leaving the empty campsite. This is 2 a.m. in the freaking remote wilderness in nowhere, Alabama. The entire campsite was empty that whole day. I just drive faster at this point leaving all our belongings behind. We arrive at the closest Walmart, maybe a 30 minutes drive and the employees are outside. Walmart is closed. Seriously, there are about 10 employees outside just staring blankly at our car. If anyone has an explanation for this, please let me know. It was eerie, but this may not be anything. I guess there might be overnight stocking where 10 employees are taking a smoke break or something at the same time, but it just seemed off. We parked in the lot away from the employees as not to spook them but they just kept staring. They didn't speak to each other or move. I decided to keep driving. I felt like I was in the twilight zone. I had no idea what to do at this point, so we just kept driving around and napped in the car with keys and ignition ready to book it if we needed to until the sun came up. We returned to the campsite, packed our stuff as fast as we could, and we never went back. We have since spent all our camping time at Chiha with no instances like this one. The weirdest part? That next morning, my husband tested our voodoo doll clip, and he came right off the car immediately. It's almost like he refused to leave our car that night to keep us safe. This probably doesn't explain everything the way it actually happened to us. But in summary, we got a really weird urge to run. Saw some weird stuff, and now I'm afraid to go back to Sipsy. What do y'all think? So I was hunting with my dad up in the mountains a few years back, and we had called it a night and returned to camp. After more than a few beers and some whiskey, we went to bed. Now we weren't sleeping in tents or anything, just some ancient army cots under the stars. After dosing off, I hear our old ice chest open and then thud shut. And that old ice chest had a very loud and squeaky hinges, so it was very noticeable. I assumed it was my dad getting a water bottle. A few seconds later, it happens again and repeats a few more times. So I turn over to ask my dad how is he so drunk that he can't operate an ice chest to find he's still asleep and snoring next to me. I reach for my maglite and shine it on the ice chest to find a black bear rummaging through it. He takes one look at me and runs off with something while I yell at him. Later the next day we find the bottle of Crown Royal a few feet away from camp unopened. We always share a laugh about that alcoholic bear. In 1999, I was working at a state park in Pennsylvania and got to know the back areas of it pretty well. The areas most tourists do not get to see. Approximately one mile from the park on a long all dirt road was a large clearing in the woods which was cleared for power lines and gas well use. Once you got to that spot you would have to walk over a long hill until you came to an old abandoned trail. If you followed this trial it would take you deep into the forest. Once day I followed it and found that it led to an old dilapidated cabin not on the park cabin records, and it looked like it hadn't been used for many decades. 
Even though it was daylight, I still got this creepy feeling like I shouldn't be there and worse. That something was watching every move I made. A few weeks later, while I was off duty, two of my friends and myself were just out driving around enjoying the summer night, and since I knew all the back roads I was taking them on kind of a tour note. None of these roads are off limits or secrets, so I wasn't breaking any rules. Other than that mysterious cabin, the park hasn't any secrets. About 11 p.m. I came to that familiar clearing, and I mentioned something about the old cabin. Being a brave soul, I talked them into letting me show them the cabin, so I grabbed my flashlight, and we took off down the hill and onto the path that led to the cabin. I took the lead and we walked halfway when all of a sudden my light flashed on something on the right side of the path. Almost immediately I stopped and said, Did you just see that? To which they responded, See what? As I panned the light back to the right side of the road I said, That! There standing by a tree was a creature only seen in sci-fi movies. It had a grayish olive color skin and very thin in its extremities. The calves and forearm muscles were very large as well was the chest. The face was the strangest thing since it had the typical alien gray head shape, but there was no mouth. It had a nose that was long and thin but not longer than its chin. The eyes had a reddish gleam in the light but not the size of most reported aliens. Very small, even by human standard. I hate to make this reference for fear of questioning my sanity, but my best description was like what the goons looked like in the Popeye cartoon. It leaning oddly against the tree, like if you were leaning on an armchair by only one arm. To make another TV show reference, but like the fonts would lean on the jukebox on happy days. Minus the legs being crossed. Immediately everyone wanted to leave, but as we turned my flashlight went out. My friends told me to quit messing with them and turn the light back on to which I informed them that I wasn't messing with them, and to keep moving now that I was at the back of the group. I frantically continued to beat on my flashlight trying to get it to work again. As soon as it came back on I immediately swiveled back around to shine it behind us. The creature had moved up significantly and now was on the left side. We hurried to the clearing and once we got back up the hill and to the main dirt road things got worse. Out of woods we had just come through was this high-pitched blood-curdling screeching noise which, after it started, others started to answer back from the other side of the clearing. The fact that I was a park ranger had been in the woods all my life and had my degree from Penn State in wildlife management means I've heard a lot of noises in the wild, but have never heard that sound before. I know it wasn't any kind of owl or bobcat, bear, bird, porcupine. You get the drift. Once I told my dad about the encounter, he told me it could been the chupacabras which I had never heard of before and as far as aliens go. Never believed in it until recently. Months went by without incident. Other than not being able to shake that I'm watching you feeling. I was to the point of feeling like I was being stalked. One night I went to get something from my truck when I looked into the woods and saw those reddish glowing eyes staring at me in the shadows. I immediately ran into the house and grabbed my biggest knife I am not a gun guy to which my dad asked me what I was doing. I told him I was tired of feeling stalked and was going to face this thing. He told me he was coming with me, but all along I knew he never truly believed me or my encounter. When we got outside he nonchalantly asked, Okay, where did you see this thing? and I pointed to the spot to which he directed his flashlight. Much to his disbelief there it was, and as soon as the light hit it tore off deep into the woods. My dad, an ex-marine who served proudly during Vietnam, yelled at me to get back into the house with fear. Fear in his voice. 
To this day, it still creeps me out telling this encounter and my hands shake, even while typing while recalling it all. I am now in my thirties with a wife and kids, but even now, when I go outside at night, I still feel watched to the point that when I get a real strong feeling my wife won't let me leave the house without her. Just as a side note, for the first five years of our relationship, she too would catch sight of this creature, but mostly as it was going into the shadows. As a further note, if anyone is questioning it, there were no drugs or alcohol or any other substance involved during this or any other encounter I have had. On my first and only backcountry hike, me and two much more experienced friends set up camp at 9,000 feet in the southern Sierra Nevada. The first day we saw a black bear cub wandering around the other side of a small lake, which was a little tense, but we didn't see any other bears the rest of the hike. That night, we all ate and then crashed early, but I'm a light sleeper and the altitude was messing with me. As I'm trying to read with my headlamp, I start to hear some low moaning sounds. It sounded like the groaning movie sound effects when a huge storm is brewing close to a ship as the winds whipped up. After a few minutes, I called out from my tent to my two friends. What the F is that? Not completely sure it wasn't a bear. They both immediately acknowledge they are alarmed as well. We all open our tent flaps and just watch as the winds get stronger and stronger. The trees at our altitude were sparse, but there were a few huge ones circling our sight. The ground we were on was mostly settled granite slag and boulders, and we were 1,000 feet from the top of a very long and very narrow canyon. Probably a half mile wide, there's probably a better geographic term for it. There were five of these canyons all descending from a 10,000 foot peak. This sound increased until the wind picked up enough to tell us it was a huge storm of some kind. No clouds, no rain, just torrential winds. The wind at our ground level was not extreme, but the sound of what was going on above us was insane. Every now and then a blast of wind would shudder through our campsite. But the tops of the trees above us were swaying so severely that the trunks were moaning as loud as a car going by. Debris was falling all around us, big enough to render us all silent, even though we could hear each other, because there was nothing we could do. I will never forget that sound. It almost sounded like a huge steel tanker crashing against rocks, with a low growl and a high-pitched squeal. With every growl came a huge gust of wind that plunged down the rocky slope in a vortex that passed maybe a hundred feet over our heads. I'll never forget watching those treetops bend to a frightening angle, and then the residual blast of air that hit a few seconds later. This is a story from my mother and younger sister, who I will refer to as S in this post. It happened in Brooklyn, New York in the late 90s. I was in the second or third grade. S was around four years old. We had a back porch overlooking a small fenced yard and lawn. We'd get the occasional regular sized praying mantis. According to S, one day she was playing in the yard while my mom was hanging laundry up on the back porch. Apparently, this thing just suddenly materialized right there in the middle of the yard, because it says she turned around and there it was. She just stared at it for a few moments, not sure if it was a toy or what. She said it looked like a two and a half to three foot long, praying mantis with big red eyes and tiny black pinpricks for pupils. When the fear finally hit her, S ran up the stairs shouting for mom. All she could express at the time was that it was a big bug. 
My mom barely reacted off because kids get scared by normal bugs all the time. Well, the damn thing followed us up the stairs. For so long I've imagined what that must have looked like. It's convinced my mom to go inside with her. That's when mom finally saw it. While she and S were watching it from inside through the mesh door, the praying mantis perched itself in one of the chairs on the porch. Not like on the top of the back cushion or on the armrest or something, just in the chair proper. When my mom went looking for a camera, all at once it just disappeared. I asked if it flew away, but neither of them have an answer. It was gone as instantly as it showed up. When my dad brought me home from school around a half hour later, they were still hiding behind the mesh door looking terrified. I never got this full version of the story till S was older. For years she would become hysterical if she ever saw a praying mantis or even the image of one. I wonder about what this thing could have been or why it only showed itself to mom and S. I do know, however, that as I got older I found that my mother was a very abusive woman and S, I believe, suffered the most because of it. Makes me wonder if one of the people I've told this story to is right about it being a demon, or at least a bad omen. About seven years ago, camping with my future wife by a small lake a few lakes over into Crown Land. Government owned, but not park land in Canada near my family cottage. We'd cleared a bit of brush right on the shore of the lake for our tent, set up camp, ate, hung our food, and went into the tent to sleep. Middle of the night I wake up to the sound of something huge moving through the bush nearby. It got closer and closer, and sped up a bit, crashed through some brush probably no more than four or five feet from the tent and kept going. Eventually close to daybreak we did get back to sleep, and in the morning we found a trail of trampled bush and unknown scat not far from where we were sleeping. I go camping quite a lot, and by camping I mean in the middle of nowhere. This one time I was trying out my new hammock on a five-day backpacking trip near Minden, Ontario. As I lay there one night thinking of the next day, this weird banging noise like if someone was hitting a stick on the tree startled me. It sounded like it was maybe ten feet from me. But I couldn't see anything, and with my hammock, I can see pretty much everything around me. The moon was so bright that if anything was around, I could easily see it. I couldn't, so I decided to go to bed. Fast forward an hour later, I hear the same thing, except this time it was closer and louder. I decided to investigate, but as soon as I moved the hammock, this thing about eight feet tall emerged from the tree line and slowly walked past my hammock about four feet from me disappearing down a grassy hill on my left. To this day, I don't know what it was, but all I know is that I almost shat my pants. So someone was following me home yesterday, and now I don't want to leave the house. I 15F was walking home from the store yesterday, and I saw a black box car drive past me extremely slow, and the man in the car clearly watching me. And when he fully passed me, I saw him watching me in his rear view mirror. I thought it was weird and slowed down my pace so that I could tell if he was waiting for me or just a slow driver. He was still driving extremely slow, but moved a little when he saw two guys riding past on bikes. He then moved to the edge of the short street we were on and waited there. 
I was still towards the beginning of the street, so I acted like I forgot something and turned around to get out of his sight. I waited and kind of peeked out to see if he had left, and when I saw he was gone I continued walking. I didn't think it would happen, but I made a mental note that if I saw the car behind me, it meant he circled back around. After I continued walking, I made three turns and was three turns away from my house. When I was walking up a little hill and almost at the four turn, I looked back and saw the man at the corner I had just turned from, letting me know he circled back around to find me. He sat there watching me continue walking until I got up the little hill and turned the corner. Then as I had just barely made the last turn and was close to my house, I saw the man's car just turn the corner up the street, straight across from the way I was walking, waiting there. I pulled out my phone to call my mom and walked the other way, and he left soon after I pulled out my phone. My mom came out and walked with me back to the house, and I didn't see the car for the rest of the day. But I keep thinking, he knows what neighborhood I stay in. What if he comes back? What if the next time he comes back I'm out by myself again? What if no one's home to call? What if he sees me leaving and comes back when I'm the only one home? I'm so scared he's going to come back I don't want to go outside. I don't want to show him where I live especially because I'm home alone very often. I have summer school and I have to go but I don't want to leave the house in fear he might be waiting for me, and I'm constantly looking out the windows to see if I can spot him. Especially since if he was at the store I was at, he definitely stays somewhere near the neighborhood. Okay, so ever since I was five, I have been sensitive to energies. I see ghosts and speak to dead people and such. But this is crazy because it has happened not one, not two, but three times. The first time it happened, I was five. I remember I had just gotten home from kindergarten and I went to take a nap. During the nap, I remember sitting at a table with my papa by this time in his life. He already had bad heart failure and kidney failure, so he was on dialysis. He told me, don't worry about anything. You will be okay at this time. I was newly diagnosed with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and that would to me later having open heart at 10, and now at 16, I'm in heart failure and stage three kidney disease. He also told me that he loves me and that he would watch me forever. I woke up and my mom was crying. I found out that my papa's heart had stopped. The next time this happens, I'm around 10 years old. I was at my dad's house and I was going to bed. My dream sequence started with me seeing my aunt on a beautiful homestead or ranch. She was dressed in a flowing white dress, and she just looked so at peace. Then I see this dark figure come, and it takes her away. While she's screaming and getting taken, she looks at me and says, I'm gone now. I woke up, and I found out she overdosed. The last time this happened was probably four years ago, maybe even earlier. I was sleeping at my grandma's house, and I have a dream about her sister, my great aunt, my great aunt had bad dementia, I see her but younger, and literally all she said was, I remember everything again, and I kid you not the next morning I find out she passed. In my family, a lot of people are Catholic, but a lot of people are also psychic and or mediums. I think I'm an empath because of my sensitivities and a lot more experiences I've had. But I don't know. This is kind of freaky. So to sum it up, I agreed to taking care of this family's dogs for five days, and the dogs have been great. Happy, healthy, normal pups in a somewhat seemingly normal house. 
I met the lady prior to coming and even came in the house and things seemed normal. First night I got here was fine until about the second day when all of a sudden the AC stopped working. It reached all the way up to 83 degrees where I was staying upstairs so I had to move down to the basement including the animals. Third night we are downstairs in the basement. Prior to going to sleep I left my phone plugged in vertically on the nightstand next to me and had all the dogs in their spots for the evening. I wake up at 4.30 a.m. I can tell by my watch to my phone being unplugged from the wall and phone completely dead. I then thinks that's strange because Ernst is no way I could do that in my sleep, but whatever. I get up to go use the restroom and I hear something in the bathroom. The shower was turned on and running water was going straight into the drain. With that being said, there was water soaked all over the ground. I had to use six towels to clean it up. Then the next day rolls around and I decided to give one of the dogs a bath in the upstairs shower at this point. The AC guy came out to fix it and said there was nothing he could do until he was able to check the pressure within a few hours he would come back. He never came back and the AC went back to normal when all of a sudden the whole shower rack falls on my head and almost hit the dog. Anyways, as the night unfolds I slept fine, but I woke up at 7.30 a.m. to let the dogs out and I go to look at my phone and the charger is bent and stuck inside my charging port. Now I have to use a different one. It's my last night here, and I don't really know what to expect now. Maybe I'm just overreacting, but something just doesn't feel right. Is this maybe something paranormal? Or just paranoia lol? Okay, so I've never posted like this before, so forgive me for any mistakes. But about an hour ago, I headed to a nearby lake, a place I usually go for my therapy sessions because it's usually pretty serene and peaceful. About 90% of the area can be seen from the busy road. However, there are a few blind spots. So I pulled into my usual parking area and immediately got a weird feeling when I saw another car parked kind of hidden under a tree close by. I'm a female in my 20s, so I'm always on high alert. I made sure to keep my eye on the car when getting my stuff together in my car. One second I look up and no one is in the car. And then a couple seconds later I look again and a man is suddenly sitting in the driver's seat staring at me. It was like he came out of nowhere. At this point I'm pretty wary about going out into the grass by the lake, but I continue to slowly pack up my stuff while continuing to keep an eye on the man in the car. I open my door and the man immediately gets out of his car and stands in front of it doing a weird stretch and still staring at me. This lake is very close to a very popular amusement park, so it's not uncommon for travelers to stop at the lake to rest. So I try to reason in my mind and decide I'll just sit in the car for my therapy appointment. I still had about 15 minutes before it started to get settled. So I get into my back seat and close and lock the doors, but rolled one window down because it was hot in the car. I open up my laptop and I look over at the man again, and now he's opening up an almost empty bottle of windshield wiper fluid and starts to pour it into his car as he looks up at me. His whole vibe was sketchy and creepy and I was debating on leaving. The man then pulls out his phone, does something on it, then continues to fill his washer fluid. All of a sudden, a white van with no windows rolls up and parks right behind me. No one gets out. I immediately climb over the console into the driver's seat and started to pull away. The van was close to my car, but there was enough room for me to back up and pull out of there. 
A couple seconds after I pull away the van follows, and the man gets back in his car. I panicked but was able to pull out onto the road in between two cars, so the van wasn't able to catch up with me. I made sure no one was following me as I drove home. It might have all been a coincidence, but better safe than sorry. I also called the non-emergency line just in case, and they said they would send an officer out there to patrol the area for a bit. Thanks for reading if you did. It was a scary experience, especially as someone who's been essayed. I'd like to hear any feedback or similar stories if anyone has any. When my uncle was in his teens and early twenties, he used to go on a yearly backpacking trip in the mountains of the Pacific Northwest near Mount Baker National Forest with a group of friends. They, there were five of them, knew each other from high school and over the years as they went their separate ways in life, college, etc. The trip became a way for them to reconnect with one another. Anyway, the first time they made this backpacking trip, they were cresting a peak and came across a wide valley view. They were off trail and making pace cross country, but could navigate well enough given geography my uncle in particular is a pretty experienced outdoorsman, and was even back then. To their surprise, especially given that there weren't any trails nearby for at least a couple miles, the group saw a large house on the side of a small lake. There was a small water plane parked on a dock adjacent the house, but other than this everything was entirely wild. No trails, no campsites, nothing. The group was shocked, but didn't think much of it the first time. It seemed to be a pretty rad house, so they assumed it belonged to some rich somebody and that it was just a private retreat. It was still pretty cool though, so they decided to return to that mountain crest every time they went on this trip to look at the house. Well, three or four years later when they came across the house there was no plane on the dock. They figured this meant that nobody was home. This time, they decided they were going to check out the house. So they made their way down, which took a while through the thick, trail-less forest. What they came to was a remarkably fancy modern-style cabin home. Three floors, huge windows, a massive deck with a state-of-the-art barbecue. Everything one would want in a sick-ass hidden mountain retreat. Cool. While they were poking around, a plane landed. Instead of running and hiding, the group decided to explain the situation. So they did when they met a nice gentleman who had flown in. He was very kind and courteous and pleased to show them his vacation house. From then on each time they went on the trip they would stop there for a night if the plane was present. Only one year my uncle became curious. What's the deal with this place? So at night, while they were sleeping in the house, he crept around and investigated a few of the many rooms it had. In the basement he found what explains everything. Massive piles of weed and brick form stacked row upon row next to stacks of cash. Instead of freaking out, he went back to sleep, and didn't tell his friends until they had left the next day. Not exactly spooky, but I feel like it fits in with the vibe of this threat. A few years back, my fiancé and I went up to stay at her parents' property in Northern California for a weekend to camp, hike, do some astrophotography, and generally just enjoy nature. This place is a good 20 minutes from any real town, and far enough from any big city that you can faintly see the glow of the Milky Way at night. The property is pretty huge and has a cabin. But we both prefer sleeping out under the stars, so we set an air mattress in the bed of my truck and pulled it up next to the pond. 
We got there a little after three in the afternoon, and after getting everything set up, we decided to go for a walk. This being just a quick walk, I left my phone, wallet, keys, etc. in my backpack to avoid any distractions, even for just a little bit. When we got back about a half hour later, I noticed that my backpack was zipped open and laying on its side. I was sure that I left it zipped up and standing up. I was concerned and brought it up to my fiancé, but she convinced me that I probably just remembered wrong, as I sometimes do. The night goes on and some clouds roll in, ruining our chance to stargaze, so we decided to get to bed a little sooner than normal to get an earlier start the next morning. After some wilderness sexy times, we hit the hay. Sometimes I have trouble sleeping at night, so while she sleeps I'm often left laying there for an hour or so until I'm actually out. It's never bothered me too much, but this night in particular I remember wishing I could have just fallen asleep. A little while after we both went to bed, I heard something splashing in the pond next to us. I didn't think much of it. Probably just a small animal, maybe a deer. Worst case scenario, maybe it was a mountain lion, but I've heard they don't bother campers all that often anyways, so I wasn't worried. It wasn't until I heard the word hey from somewhere across the pond that I was legitimately freaked out. My heart was beating out of my chest. I turned my head to see that my fiance was still fast asleep, which was good because I don't even want to imagine how she would have reacted. I laid in silence for what felt like hours, but probably just about five seconds later I heard the word hey again. This time it was a little closer than before, and I knew it wasn't just the wind or my ears playing tricks on me. One afternoon in Temp, Arizona, a man walked into a hotel where I worked. He had a coat on a pea green military type coat and butcher paper, yes. He had butcher paper around himself like some kind of tube top, under his coat like a shirt. In addition, one of his legs was twice as big as the other. He asked to use the payphone in the lobby. I told him, sure not yet realizing how weird he looked he was obscured by the desk and the entry door. We started out with a weird vibe the moment he crossed the lobby to the phone. When we finally got a chance to look at him, he walked a bit slow. However, this made sense as his leg appeared swollen. He then made a call and turned slightly to keep me and my co-worker in his attention sort of out of his peripheral vision. Very soon we could tell he wasn't listening to anyone and the phone made noises like it was off the hook. I decided that was enough and demanded he leave, which he did abruptly by our side door. Now the really weird part. My co-worker took a picture of him on that payphone with an old flip phone. In the digital pixelation, he was moving which rendered him blurrier than the rest of the picture. He looked like his face was an oversized, toothy, grinning skull, black eyes and a hole where his nose should be. It was so bizarre. It reminds me of the story about the man made of parts in the mirrored sunglasses, a story from Victoria, England, in which a man encountered a man he thought was made of parts. Later that day, a police officer came to the hotel asking if we had seen a man fitting the same description. I acknowledged that we had and told the police officer what occurred. I then inquired why he was asking about this bizarre man. The police officer stated that the man was seen in a nearby park by a couple who later reported that the man had suddenly vanished into thin air just a few yards away from them. This occurred in late 2019 before the sea lockdown. I haven't heard anything further about the unknown man or whatever he was.
So, I need some advice. I live in the backwoods of NEPA and yesterday while hiking into state game lands. I heard my nephew screaming for help. Mind you, I am three miles from any roads and they were miles away shopping. My dog was terrified. I was wary and ignored the yelling and just pretended it didn't happen. It went off and on for an hour or so and then silence. I continued my way back home through the woods when I was done. Last night, after a bunch of storms rolled through, I hear my dog's collar tags tingling outside, like he's running walking all sorts of tingles. He was next to me, his collar off for the night. He then proceeded to go hide upstairs next to my dad for the night. He's never done that before. Am I experiencing a skinwalker? I feel like I led something home yesterday. I was told to keep quiet about the story, but I can't I need explanations. To begin I'm ex-special forces. I was a British Army commando after serving as an artillery officer. A lot of my training consisted of forest or jungle survival and got me interested in nature. But Britain didn't have any truly wild forests, so I was left wanting more. A few years later, a transfer opportunity opened up to the U.S., so I took it, excited by the potential forests to trek through. Long story short, the program I was working on was suspended due to an intelligence cock-up. So I got six months of paid leave and met up with my friend who was a park ranger. I'm not giving his actual name or of the park for reasons so everyone or place names have been altered, let's call him Jim. We were hanging out at his cabin with his colleague Nick. I was telling them stories of my time on tour in the Middle East when the radio in the cabin goes off. Jim comes out with a serious face and tells Nick to get mounted up for a search and rescue. He the asks if I want to come so I agree and got suited up in my combat uniform. I had nothing else as I thought I would only be a couple hours we arrive at a clearing with 40 other people. We were informed that a boy and girl were missing from their beds in a family cabin. This seemed odd to me and recently becoming a father I understood how important it was to find them. We left in a party of seven and armed to the teeth as there were bears around and we didn't have time to mess around. We searched for hours and nothing turned up. It was getting dark and we began to head back to my eight-seater Land Rover and I noticed something off in the dark. It was set of stairs. I asked Jim, what the hell are they doing out here? His response was, just keep going. Not in a menacing tone, but in a strict tone that a parent would use in a fire drill or something. But when he flicked off the safety of his rifle, I knew something was up. We got back to the Land Rover and started a back to the clearing during the ride. I was told to never tell anyone what I saw. We got back and I was told to stay by the truck, just in case another group found them as my truck was the same type that were used as military ambulances in the 50s and out of all the vehicles was the most suitable for the job. Jim and Nick got out and the others just stayed in packing medical and food supplies on the truck. Fifty feet in front of me was the leader of the search party. I never paid any attention to his rank or whatever it's called and he and Jim were talking, and he turned looked at me and nodded at which I confidently nodded back. Minutes later Jim and Nick returned at which I asked him what was the talk about Jim said it was about how lucky we are to have special forces with us and it should be a bit easier. But I knew it was about the stairs I saw in the woods. Hours passed in the truck waiting for the call to provide assistance that we get it from another park ranger, 20 miles north of the cabin, who said he found an abandoned shoe belonging to a kid. We rushed out there and met up with a ranger and searched the near woods. The trees were tall and thick with foliage, so our torches had to be powerful to pierce the leaves and branches of trees. Jim shouted us over saying, there's something here. As we approached, we found that it was blood, thick, glossy blood. I would to say I've seen my share of death, 
I've had close friends blown up, and even a guy I trained with got captured and brutally killed to death, but the scene that lay before me will haunt me for life. I won't give detailed description because it's too gore for YouTube, but it's about kids and they were 60 feet up in the tree. I've never returned and will never but the stairs and the latter one regarding kids were connected somehow and I need some closure because the rangers still to this day refuse to talk about them. I hope the anonymity of the internet will change that. Please help me get the answers I need. My dad was hiking or stalking. They were in their military-grade ghillie suits with four friends near Long Beach, Washington. It was absolutely miserable weather, pouring down rain, when they found this creepy shack in the woods. It was situated by a gravel road, and on the road about ten red cars were lined up only red cars, and a huge bonfire was blazing outside the shack. They crept up closer to the shack, and they heard voices. The door then opened and they hid in the brush and out come about 20 naked people who start dancing in a circle around the fire like a witch party. One of the guys took a break and pissed on the bush my dad's friend was hiding in. They waited a few minutes and snuck out through the woods. They have never gone back. Not saying satanic cult, but all red cars, creepy shack, bonfire, dancing around said bonfire while naked during a storm. Did I mention the place had no address either? When I was a venture scout, my crew and I went to New Mexico for a backpacking trip. On the eighth day in, two other guys and myself had to go fetch creek water that was two miles away or so, the map said. We've already hiked around six miles that day, so by the time we set out it was getting close to sundown. As we made our way to the creek, we came to a fork in the road and had to consult the map. The oldest of us was on watch duty in case any feral animal came upon us, and we needed to hightail it out there. Well, while me and my other friend were figuring out which road to take the watchman taps us on the shoulder and tells us to be quiet. We shot up and looked to where he is pointing. It was what I assumed to be a mountain lion, maybe 300 feet from us and 50 feet above us on the cliff. He was looking right at us. For whatever reason, he never pounced or attacked us. He was just observing us. We carefully backed away from him, and once we thought we reached a safe distance, we just calmly hiked away from all the while our hearts were pounding. In the end, we got the water after being observed by what we thought was a mountain lion. Scared poopless. Several years ago, a friend and I were hiking along the Appalachian Trail in North Georgia, and we stopped on a bald hilltop overlooking a scenic valley with pines and dogwoods along the bottom by a creek. It had been overcast all day with rumblings of thunder, but no rain. I was looking down at the bottom of the valley, and suddenly, all the trees in one spot started shaking violently back and forth. Then the cloud cover above it dropped like a ton of bricks. It was a moment I will never forget. It looked like the clouds in an area of 100 square meters just fell out of the sky and slammed into the treetops at the bottom of the valley. Branches, leaves, and debris exploded from the trees, resembling something from Lost or King Kong. I half expected a giant gorilla to come bounding out of the tree cover. Then, a small funnel cloud formed right above it. Keep in mind, we were about 200 meters away on the top of a bald hilltop. Luckily, the tornado petered out after only a few seconds and we quickly descended from the top of that hill and down the other side into tree cover. I was so amped up on adrenaline that I had to drink about four or five rusty nails that night to go to sleep. A very awesome experience that I will never forget. We are small and insignificant compared to Mother Nature. We control nothing.
I was 18 years old, spending time at my aunt's house for a family reunion when a powerful headache and stomach discomfort suddenly struck me. Overwhelmed by drowsiness, I decided it was best to go to bed. As I closed my eyes, a bewildering shift occurred. I found myself in a peculiar metallic room, lying on a cot-like bed, utterly immobilized. Surrounding me were four humanoid beings, each standing at a height of four feet. They possessed a slender physique and wore tight-fitting gold-colored outfits with matching gold sandals. Their hands, notably, had six fingers. In an unexpected turn of events, a door materialized on the metallic wall, and a tall figure entered the room. This figure resembled an exceptionally attractive man, with white skin, blonde hair, and a radiant aura surrounding him. Clad in a long white tunic that reached his ankles, he wore silvery sandals. I noticed a gold ring on his finger, featuring the imprinted image of a pyramid. The tall, blonde individual approached me while one of the shorter humanoids handed him a transparent sphere containing an electronic chip-like device. Placing the sphere over my forehead, it levitated before hovering over various parts of my body, eventually disappearing. At that moment, the blonde man drew nearer, and through a form of telepathy without moving his lips, he assured me not to be afraid. Intrigued, I asked why I was chosen, to which he explained that it was due to my possession of a unique and special energy from birth. Soon after, I regained my ability to move, and they guided me into another room that appeared to be a control center. Inside, three of the shorter humanoids operated various consoles. Suddenly, a massive screen became visible, displaying the alignment of planets. I watched as the Earth appeared, albeit inverted. Then, a scene resembling a nuclear explosion unfolded, depicting immense death and destruction. I received a warning that humanity was on a path leading to such devastation unless we changed our ways. As I took in the profound revelation, another door came into view. I noticed a vast hangar filled with numerous dome-shaped disk objects. The tall, blonde figure noticed my gaze and proceeded to touch my forehead with a finger. In an instant, I found myself back in bed. For the following three hours, I remained in a state of mental confusion, trying to make sense of the extraordinary encounter. I'll never forget that fateful evening when my friend and I encountered the mysterious creature in the entrance zone of the natural park. It was already getting dark, and the forest's border seemed to be closing in on us. We had heard strange canine sounds all along the way, as if some creature was upset and following us, but we kept our calm as best we could. Finally, we reached the car parked near the fence at the entrance door. My heart was pounding as my friend switched on the car's lights, and that's when he saw it a towering six-foot-tall dogman standing just a few meters away on the other side of the fence. My friend was colorblind, so he couldn't tell me the color of its eyes, but their shine in the darkness was enough to terrify him. I couldn't see the creature directly, but the fear in my friend's eyes was enough to convince me that something was terribly wrong. We wasted no time and quickly drove away from there, leaving the strange creature behind. It didn't follow us, but the memory of that encounter haunted us for a long time. As we tried to make sense of what we had witnessed, my friend shared a chilling story with me about his father and his sister's ex-boyfriend. They had their own eerie encounter just a week before, behind the chalet located near a big marsh connected to the natural park. That night, they were drawn outside by a commotion and found a large black dog with broad shoulders eating something in the bushes. But this was no ordinary dog. It quickly turned its attention towards them and started growling menacingly. Fearing for their safety, my friend's father grabbed a large stick, preparing for the words. T. 
But then, to their shock, the creatures stood up on two legs, taking on an almost human-like appearance. The father was bewildered by the sight, and the ex-boyfriend turned pale as a ghost. After a tense moment, the dogman took a few steps towards them, but eventually backed away, returning to all fours and swiftly disappearing into the marsh. My friend's father and the ex-boyfriend decided not to tell him about the creature standing up on two legs, believing it might have been too traumatizing for him. Little did they know that a week later, he would come face to face with the same mysterious entity, and the truth would come to light. Since that summer, my friend's family never encountered the dogmen around their chalet again. We couldn't determine if it was merely passing through the area, or if it still lurked nearby, avoiding human contact. Perhaps others in the area had similar experiences, but kept silent about it, either out of fear or disbelief. We often wondered if there was a connection between the dogmen we encountered and the one seen by my friend's family. The proximity of the natural park and the chalet suggested they might be part of the same pack or group. But regardless of the truth, one thing was certain we had experienced something beyond the ordinary, something that would forever remain etched in our memories, and we would always tread carefully whenever we ventured near that bordering forest or the marsh. Last summer I felt like camping one weekend so myself and a buddy went to a spot he knew about that wasn't too far from where we lived. About 40 minute drive and a few kilometers hike to the spot. I've always been a big pussy about the dark. My imagination is stupid and vivid and F with me. Anyway we were settling down for the night and we had our tents set up about 50 feet from each other because I snore sometimes plus no spots could fit both tents as it was pretty thick with brush and rock. I get woken up at some point by a noise. My heart is racing, but I figure I'm going to hear a lot of noises in the bush at night and try to go back to sleep. As I'm drifting off I hear a loud crack, almost like a gunshot in the near distance. I sit straight up and start sweating. What the F was that? No way that is an animal. Then I hear a cough and someone clearing their throat. My mind is running through all sorts of crazy scenarios, so I text my friend, Are you awake? Did you hear that? No answer. Another throat clear. My brain convinces itself that my friend is now dead and we are being hunted. I freeze and grab my knife so I can poke my head out. If I'm going to die, I'd rather not do it shaking like a leaf in my sleeping bag. I get two steps out of my tent and a crouched figure is moving towards me. Again my legs freeze for a sec and then... My friend lights his smoke and says, check this out. What the F, you're alive. I nearly shit myself. Jesus. What was that noise then? Turns out it was seals playing in the water. They slap the surface really hard, and it makes a very loud crack. I felt really dumb, but goddamn was I genuinely scared for a bit. This happened when I was about 14-15 and often stayed over at my cousin and her husband's house, we'll call them Skylar and Josh, I think F24 and 26 at the time I'd been staying at their house for a week straight prior to the incident with no issues. It was the summertime in a neighborhood that was pretty rapidly expanding. You know those monochrome suburban nightmare cul-de-sacs. There were tons of half-finished houses lining the far end of the neighborhood. I feel this info is pretty important. Anyways, Josh and I are avid movie watchers and stayed up late most nights watching whatever looked good. That night, Skylar went to bed early and we stayed up to watch Would You Rather, then Ridiculous Six Movie Sucks, by the way. Semi-important context, Josh is a smoker and goes out to the back patio for a cigarette every so often, especially at night when he takes their beagle, Banjo, out to pee. 
I end up sleeping through the movie on one of their two couches. This couch is backed against a wall, and to the left of it is a window into the backyard. It's the only window in the living room. At some point, I keep hearing banjo whooping and hollering in the playroom, then again in the kitchen, then the playroom, and so on so forth. Dog's going apeshit in literally every room of the first floor, but he's a clingy dog that hated when Skylar and Josh shut him out of their room, so I figured he was just whining. He's also a beagle, so we're used to him being vocal. I'm hindsight, I probably should have wondered why he was running from room to room though. Whatever, I try to sleep through it. After a good while of Banjo flipping his shit in what I think is the kitchen, he kinda goes quiet, but he wakes me up again growling at the window right next to the couch I'm sleeping on. Bro will not be still. I still don't get up. I fall back asleep for a bit, then out of nowhere he jumps on the couch, right on my stomach, and again starts losing his shit barking and howling. That wasn't what woke me up though. It was the light shining from outside the window right in my face. I wasn't scared at first, more confused than anything since my eyes haven't adjusted at this point. Then the flashlight shines up right on this man's face, and he looks identical to Josh. Could have been twins. He's crouched down with his face almost right up on the glass, and when I see him, I jump really hard. I don't remember if I screamed, but the man starts laughing at me, and I can hear it from the other side of the window. However, because I'm big stupid, I assume it's Josh on a smoke break, just trying to spook me. I start walking upstairs, and I pass by their kitchen clock. Bitch, it was like 4 a.m. I didn't even put two and two together that Josh has no reason to be outside and awake at this hour. I'm so groggy but also unnerved at this point so I go sleep on the upstairs hallway floor. I didn't go alert Skylar of what just happened, mostly because she's a cranky bitch when you wake her up, and I was still more willing to accept the idea that it was Josh being an idiot on a smoke break, rather than some maniac scoping out the house. The next afternoon, I bring it up to them, and they sort of write it off, ask me if I'm sure I wasn't dreaming, etc., but they did say they heard the dog going wild. I check outside where the window is to see if the man dropped any evidence of him being there, and I kinda wanted to vomit. The tall grass along the house was pressed down like someone was on their knees. I don't even want to know how long the man was sitting there for the grass to have been pressed down still, but I have a feeling it was pretty long, because Banjo sat by that window for a hot minute and the flashlight is the only thing that woke me up. I'm glad I saw the grass though because it felt like such a fever dream. Sometimes I still wonder if it happened, but I know it did. My theory is that some squatter in those unfinished houses was either bored or on something and decided to go on an adventure. But yeah, I would have absolutely gotten my shit rocked in a horror movie at that age. Today I had another scary experience. It was around 4.23 am. I woke up from my sleep and felt thirsty so I drank some orange juice next to me and planned to go back to sleep. After a couple minutes of quietness I felt sleepy and closed my eyes until I heard knocking on my window, which scared me. I felt fear when I heard it because my window is next to me. It's above me by 7 inches. This was the second time I heard it since a month or two ago. I remember it so well because I was up watching some cartoons around 2 a.m. when I heard knocking coming my window. And I didn't bother looking outside since there is some curtains blocking the view. I told a friend about this today and they said it was probably some branches or an animal. But I told them I sleep in the second floor of the house and there a screen window frame outside the window, which is impossible for something to knock from the outside without removing the window screen. 
Does anyone have any experience with something or have any ideas on what it could be? A year ago, the crone-like spirit of an old woman haunted me. A medium explained that this spirit was my teacher in a past life, and that she'd returned to guide me in divination and intuition. My attempts to establish a safe relationship with this spirit were not respected, so I asked a shaman friend for help in clearing this entity from my house. The night before my friend came over, I was so nauseous I could barely sleep. That entire day, I collected things for the ritual. I had 13 red and 13 white carnations, Florida water, the bell and candles from my own altar and sage. I felt prepared if uncertain. When I did sleep that night, my dreams were dark and disturbing. My husband, the cat, and the dog all seemed on edge. That morning, my friend arrived shortly after my husband left for work. Opening all the window and the doors, we began setting up the space by lighting candles and smudging every corner of the apartment. The sage burst and crackled, shedding sparks among thick, fragrant smoke. I lost two good duvet covers that day. Both pets retreated immediately beneath their respective beds and stayed hidden for the duration. Preparing to call the cardinal corners, my friend used his phone's compass to confirm the directions. It was way off. I know my house and my corners, and so oriented us correctly. But I felt suspicious, like maybe the entity herself was sabotaging our efforts to remove her. Finally, we began, my friend, beating a low, steady rhythm on his animal skin drum, invoke the guidance and protection of the spirit animals of the earth and the sky. I followed behind him, ringing the altar bell as he spit sprayed mouthfuls of spirit water throughout the apartment. Throughout this, two things rolled around in the back of my mind. The first, what will the neighbors think? The second was that I might vomit. The nausea I'd felt since the night before had increased past the point of simple discomfort. Next, my friend took the red carnations in batches, dipping them into a bowl of spirit water, then circling them in mid-air, just like we'd done while smudging. He went room by room, discarding the used flowers onto the newsprint we'd placed on the coffee table at the center of the apartment. Halfway through his work, he paused and suddenly rushed into the bathroom, becoming violently ill. In that exact moment, I lost the battle with my own nausea. Thank goodness for close friends and multiple bathrooms. Eventually, he'd used all of the carnations throughout the entire space. Perched on our couch, he ended the ceremony with frantic drumming and full voice singing. I could physically feel the energies in my home shifting around us. I gave one last thought to our neighbors and then joined him. My throat raw from the smoke and being sick, I sang out in my loudest voice to move the energies swirling throughout my home. Finally, the ritual was over. We placed the white carnations in a vase on the coffee table. If the ritual had truly exercised the spirits, he said, the carnations would still be white tomorrow when we woke. I thanked my friend and he left. At his instruction, I then bundled the red carnations in the newsprint and carried them to the seaside, burying them in the sandy soil near a banyan tree. I was too tired when I got home to notice if anything felt different. I simply stumbled inside and fell straight into bed, briefly mourning the burn holes in my duvet. I slept most of the afternoon and all through the night. The following day, the white carnations were still white. I also wrapped these flowers in newspaper, burying them beneath a different tree in the park. As I covered my parcel with the last handfuls of soil, the nausea I'd felt for days cleared instantly, like gray clouds clearing to reveal blue sky. I suddenly felt fine, also very hungry. I returned to a house that felt peaceful and ordered. I paid careful attention over the next several days, trying to suss out whether our banishment had succeeded. 
The crone was, and nearly a year later still is gone. Phew. I know that was a lot. I've had many strange and spooky experiences throughout my life. Holler if you'd like to hear more. Thanks for reading, folks. This happened to me and my then roommate a few years ago. We were just chilling on the couch and listening to the rain outside, when at one point we started talking about how the rain sounded like the sea, and how we pictured a lighthouse on a windy shore. I know this sounds crazy and maybe like we were on drugs, but we were not, we were completely sober. Slowly but surely the conversation between my friend and I started to shift to a visualization, or perhaps a hypnosis. It's unclear to me how this normal conversation about a lighthouse turned into the shared vision or dream it did, but at one point we were both there in the lighthouse. We both saw a man there, dressed in a yellow raincoat. He had a weathered face and a gray beard, but most remarkably in the place where his eyes were supposed to be there were two black holes, as if they had been gauged out and only some rotting black skin remained. We both felt this intense urge to get out, so we ran away from the lighthouse to the woods as he followed us. I'm not sure about how we woke up from this hypnosis, dream, vision, or whatever it was, but I remember realizing this was bad and we needed to wake up, so I urged my roommate to do so. After I returned to my body, I gently woke them up and we discussed what happened. When we had entered this state, it was around 12 midnight, but when we woke up it was about 3 a.m., Yet it felt like we had only been doing this for 15 minutes. The next day we both separately drew the man we saw we were both illustration students without having discussed what he looked like. We drew the exact same man and had given him the exact same name, the Weirman. My question is, what was this? A state of hypnosis we entered through the rain? Foley adieu? Or something supernatural? If so, does anyone recognize a figure of a lighthouse keeper in a yellow raincoat with no eyes? Yes, this is real, and it happened this morning. I woke up feeling like any other ordinary day. The sun was slowly peeking through the curtains, casting a warm glow in the room. I needed to charge my phone so I went to unplug my roommate's phone to plug mine in. That's when I saw it a missed call notification on her phone. Curiosity got the better of me, and I glanced at the caller ID below the phone number. Without thinking, I blurted out the name of the caller to my roommate. She chuckled, assuming I was playing a prank, until I handed her the phone. I could see her face change in an instant, her expression filled with disbelief and fear. She stammered, telling me it was her mom who was calling. Her mom, who had tragically passed away in 2006. The phone call had ended a second after she realized who it was. As she tried to gather her thoughts, she decided to call the number back. To our astonishment, an automated voice answered, saying, Press 1 for yes and 2 for no. We were both perplexed and terrified. How was it possible that her deceased mother's phone number was calling her? Her mom's number had never been stored in her contacts. It couldn't be a simple glitch. This was far too eerie and unsettling for that. A million questions raced through our minds. Was someone playing a sick joke, or was this something much more sinister? Could someone be stalking her? using her deceased mother's number to torment her? Or was it some inexplicable paranormal occurrence? We sat there, hearts pounding, minds racing. The room seemed to grow colder as we contemplated the inexplicable event. Our thoughts were consumed by the possibilities of what this could mean. Were we in danger? Was her mother trying to send a message from beyond the grave? Neither of us knew what to do next. Fear and confusion engulfed us. We decided to reach out to friends and family to see if they had experienced anything similar 
or had any insights into this strange phenomenon. No one had answers, and each call only added to the sense of unease. Hours passed, and we were still no closer to understanding what had happened. It felt like we were caught in a surreal nightmare, unable to wake up. As the day wore on, we tried to distract ourselves, but the bizarre event lingered in the back of our minds, haunting us. Finally, as the evening set in, we found some solace in each other's company. Together, we held on to the hope that maybe it was just an inexplicable glitch or a cruel prank. We agreed to keep a close eye on our phone and seek help if anything like this ever happened again. As the night crept in, we sought refuge in the presence of friends and tried to find comfort in the mundane routines of everyday life. Yet deep down, we knew that this strange and unsettling event had forever changed our perception of reality. To this day, we remain haunted by that inexplicable phone call. We may never know the truth behind what happened that morning, but one thing is certain it left an indelible mark on our lives, a chilling reminder that sometimes the boundaries between the living and the beyond are not as clear as we'd like to believe. I worked as a park ranger, so one night I received a distress call about a group of hikers who had become trapped in an uncharted section of the deep forest. Determined to find them, I set out on patrol, equipped with my flashlight and a compass. The darkness enveloped the trees, casting eerie shadows that danced with every gust of wind. As I made my way along the trail, my heart pounded in anticipation. The hikers had reported their approximate location, and I focused on following their path. But as I ventured deeper into the forest, a strange feeling washed over me, a feeling that I was being watched. Suddenly, out of nowhere, a figure appeared in the distance. My heart skipped a beat as I strained my eyes to see. As I drew closer, my breath caught in my throat. It was a creature I had never encountered before. It resembled a Sasquatch, but its thick red hair and deep, piercing human-like eyes set it apart. I called out, my voice echoing through the trees, demanding answers. But the creature simply disregarded me and disappeared into the dense woods, leaving me stunned and filled with an inexplicable mixture of awe and confusion. What had I just witnessed? Was it truly a Bigfoot or merely an elaborate prank? Shaking off the encounter, I continued my search for the lost hikers. Their safety was my primary concern, and I pushed myself to navigate through the labyrinth of trees and underbrush. The sounds of rustling leaves and distant animal calls intensified my determination. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, I stumbled upon the hikers. They were exhausted and frightened but relieved to see me. I quickly reassured them and guided them back towards the safety of the established trails. As I led them out of the wilderness, my mind remained fixated on the creature I had encountered earlier. Once the hikers were safe, I took a moment to reflect. What was the true nature of the creature I had seen? A few years back I lived in Arizona. I would always travel to Tucson, Mesa, and Flagstaff, but spent most of my time living in good old Phoenix. While down near Tucson, really close to San Xavier Reservation, I was wandering in a small town and stayed near the edge of the town so I can take in the view of the Bear Desert during the day. I was much younger than I am right now. So this might have been just my imagination, but I don't think so. My imagination wasn't that visual and messed up. While staring into the night of the desert to take a quick leak and get back on the road, I got done draining the lizard and tried to take in the view of pitch black valley illuminated by passing car lights and the starlit sky. I would look into the desert when a car passed by and would gaze into the distance for a split second 
Nothing came up, and I didn't think anything would. The Arizona Valley was something I've always been used, that being that, the darkness of the desert was nothing to fear for me. After about the 10th or 11th car passed, I spotted something in the distance that caught me off guard, and at first, I didn't pay any mind to it. I was curious and waited for a car's light to light up some of the distance. Now, of course, cars didn't illuminate the whole valley. Only about 15, 20 feet or 20, 30 feet. So whatever I saw was pretty damn close. Way too close for comfort. I stayed for another car to pass, which felt like five minutes, which was only 10 seconds in reality. After the a couple cars passed to light up my vision, 15th car speeds by. Holy ass, I think to myself after realizing what I saw wasn't just my mind messing with me. I saw what seemed to be a person walking alone. It would have thrown me off if it was a regular guy wandering in the dark. But what really messed with me was how it walked and looked. The only way to describe his, or hers, or whatever the F it was, was like a cripple or a mentally handicapped person that has been in a wheelchair all their life trying to walk, stumbling and waddling, dragging their leg ever so often. From what little I made out of its facial features made me cringe and shudder, making my stomach drop to my ass. Its face seemed to be male. Its jaw was disfigured, and the face was ghastly skinny and empty. Big eye bags that made its eye sockets look empty, mouth wide open that also looked hollow. Other physical attributes I made out was that it had no cloths, deathly skinny, tall and I mean freakishly tall, and incredibly dirty, probably looked white. From how dirty it was I would have thought it wasn't even human. After I've seen all I needed to see I noped the F out of there. Hopped back into the car and went on with my night. Wasn't able to sleep that night because I couldn't help get curious or think about it. Not sure what the F it was. Maybe I was straight trippin' that night, but it seemed way too real to be my imagination or random hallucinations. And for the record, there aren't any homeless people just wandering the desert in the dead of night with no cloths on that I've seen or heard of. But please, give me your thoughts and tread on this post if you think it's bullshit. I don't blame you. But I swear it was as real as possible. I grew up in rural southwestern Ontario and our property was flanked by trees and then it was 100 acres of corn. One summer evening, we were playing hide-and-seek with some friends and family. I was hiding near a pine tree about 50 meters from the road waiting until I could avoid the person who was it. I was the last person and could see everyone else waiting for me on the porch yelling to hurry up so we could start the next round. Suddenly, I hear what are clearly footsteps behind me, and I bolt assuming it's my cousin who is it trying to tag me. I sprint across the yard and make it to the porch only to realize he is on the opposite side of the house. We suddenly hear or see car lights as it starts up and peels down the road. I have no idea why someone would get out of their car, walk 50 meters through the corn, but I was certainly spooked and assumed they had malicious intent. My parents were all into the supernatural and said it was a ghost, which in retrospect seems like a dumb thing to say to a nine-year-old child. But whoever it was gave me a scare that I still won't forget. I was 41 years old, out hunting in a remote and appropriately named area when something truly bizarre caught my attention. There, on the ground, was a dark purple object the size of an 18-wheeler, resembling a bat wing. It had a drawbridge-like door that stood open. Nearby, I spotted three creatures engaged in trying to capture an alligator. 
These beings wore what seemed like golden crowns, had human-like faces with long hair, and possessed sharp, lion-like teeth. They donned breastplates resembling cast iron. The most astonishing aspect was the presence of four-wing-like protrusions and scorpion-like tails on each creature. Initially, the creatures were unaware of my presence. However, when one of them spotted me, I quickly reacted and fired my 12-gauge shotgun. The shot hit one of the creatures in the chest, knocking it down momentarily. But astonishingly, it swiftly got back on its feet and retaliated by firing some sort of implement that dangled from its waist. A beam-like light struck my wrist, leaving behind a scar. Unfortunately, the incident resulted in the loss of most of the functionality in my arm. Undeterred, I fired another shot, prompting the humanoids to rise into the air and retreat back inside their object. The door closed, and the craft took off at an incredible speed. From that day forward, I vowed never to hunt in those woods again, forever haunted by the unnerving encounter. I consider myself a very analytical person, not easily swayed by something I see or feel. This is the reason why it took me so long to write this up, and if you read my earlier post, you would understand. This happened in October of 2017. It was right around 5 p.m. I was just doing my daily patrol through a farming community close to my station that was mostly abandoned after sunset due to trespassing, theft, and mischief. After making rounds checking empty buildings and barns with little to no activity, I headed back towards the main road about 500 meters from where I started off at. As I got closer to the paved asphalt of the highway, there were farm fields on each side of me as far as my eye could see. To my immediate right was a large pumpkin field that had mature pumpkins, and although the ones closer to me were ripe, I noticed some green ones on others further in the distance. I slowed down quite a bit when I saw this, so I could take a better look at them just in case there might be someone trying to steal them. Although it was getting dark, it wasn't quite sunset yet. As I got closer, just within the 30 meters of these pumpkins, something caught my attention. It was similar to when you catch movement out of your peripheral. But when you look over, there's nothing there. So naturally, I've been in countless situations in which I've had to defend myself or apprehend someone. I immediately slowed down, put my cruiser in park, reached for my flashlight, and grabbed the pepper spray on the passenger side. As I was reaching for these items, I noticed something very small crawling across this large rock next to the pumpkins. At first glance, it looked like a little misshapen little man. It didn't seem to have any gender or sex, nor did it appear to be an adolescent child due to its size. Before stopping, shifting into reverse, and backing up, the creature apparently sensed me somehow and quickly scampered off behind the pumpkin towards a thicket of trees. The whole thing happened so fast that all I could do was put the car back in drive and proceed back to the station. When I got home, I decided to try and look online for what this might have been. I came across this subreddit. Now, months later, after counseling through an officer assistance program, I feel comfortable being able to talk about it without feeling like I need somebody to watch over me 24-7. It had to have either been a gnome, a troll, or a goblin, as ridiculous as it sounds, made even admitting that they're real. So our boys' ages are three and two. A few days ago, about 30 minutes after we had put the boys to bed, I was in our front living room when all of the sudden I heard our oldest son crying out for me. I peeked my head out into the hallway and looked into our other living room real quick to see if my husband was already on it. 
He wasn't, so I walked down the hallway and went into the boys' bedroom and both of the boys were sound asleep. Weird. I shut the door and walk into the main living room where my husband was and told him what just happened. He just shrugged his shoulders and said he didn't hear anything. The room I was in is closer to their bedroom so I could see how he didn't hear him. Then last night, just after midnight, I laid down to go to bed. I was almost asleep until I heard my youngest son start to cry over the monitor. I waited a few seconds to see if he was just moving around and would fall back asleep, or if it was the real deal. He starts hysterically crying so I jump up and run down the hallway to their bedroom. The boys are sound asleep. I'm very confused. I go back to bed and fall asleep. Now a little backstory, I am a very heavy sleeper. My husband always had to wake me up when the boys were babies when they would wake up in the middle of the night because I didn't hear them. He always says I could sleep through the world ending and I would never know. So after I fell back asleep I get woken up at 5 a.m. to my youngest son, hysterically crying again over the monitor. A little side note, both times I look at the monitor I don't see either of the boys moving. I see them peacefully sleeping, but I hear the saying. I get my sleepy self up, look over at my sleeping husband, thought it strange that he was asleep and didn't wake me up, and sleeplessly walked down to the boy's bedroom. They are both sound asleep. Now I feel like I'm losing it. I know what I heard. No TVS were on when any of these occurrences happened. We don't own a radio. And our monitor is one of those dinosaur ones, so it doesn't hook up to Wi-Fi or anything. And the first occurrence with my oldest son, I heard with my own ears when my son was crying mommy. I didn't even have the monitor on. I feel like I'm going crazy. Nothing like this has ever happened before. One time I got woken up to something whistling outside our bedroom windows at 3 a.m. A few months ago. It kept moving from one window to the other in a matter of seconds. Very eerie whistling. We have a fenced-in backyard and the one window is in the fenced-in area. Our fence is six feet high so that scared me even more thinking something was on our roof. I was absolutely terrified and frozen in bed. It finally stopped and I went back to bed. I talked to our next door neighbor about it that's lived out here his whole life and he said he's seen and heard things out here that people would think he's insane. We live on a quiet dead end road with a swamp or heavy woods in our backyard. In 2009 I attended college at the University of Maryland or Eastern Shore. I always felt overwhelmed with studying and assignments and spent most of my time inside. My roommate and I decided to abandon our schoolwork one weekend and have an adventure. We agreed to go to Asadeg Island. It's a barrier island and a refuge for wildlife. I was most excited to check out the feral ponies I had heard about. There do not seem to be many places where you can see wild horses anymore. So we decided to camp even though it was the off-season in Chile. At least there were no crowds. We borrowed a bunch of gear from our hardcore camping friend and headed out. We stopped at the visitor center and the rangers told us where we would be likely to see the horses. They told us to make sure we put away all of our food items whenever we were away from the campsite. We showed them the bear-proof cooler we had borrowed, and they said that was fine. We set up our camping spot and went to the recommended trail, and when we were out there we caught sight of horses off in the distance. They told us to stay at least 40 feet away. We were happy to get a distant view of horses across an inlet. However, we were really excited when the herd stormed through the water and toured the area where we were standing. There must have been three different herds while we hiked that morning. 
We had binoculars to spot them in the distance and were satisfied with our sightings by noon. We had a cookout and relaxed on the beach. I was ready for bed early and got into my sleeping bag after sunset with my book. I must have fallen asleep immediately. The next thing I knew I was woken up by something howling. Now I'm familiar with coyotes and wolves, but this did not sound like that. It was higher and more shrill. It gave me goosebumps all over and I could feel it getting closer. I convinced myself it must be one of the island foxes, so I just fell asleep again. But then this horrible growl woke me up again. It was a low growl, guttural, and rumbling. I could hear something rustling outside the tent. It was probably half an hour before the noises stopped and I could sleep again. The next day we decided to take the wildlife loop trail. It was maybe three miles long and gave good views of marsh and forest. We spent a long time exploring. By the time we decided to head back to camp, we were both pretty tired, and it was almost sunset. We came over the crest of a dunes and could see our tent a ways away. It looked like it was fluttering in the wind more than it should be. I could tell there was some stuff on the ground by the tent, and I remember saying how weird that was. As we got closer, we could see that the tent door was hanging unzipped and flapping around. The stuff on the ground was our gear, sleeping bags and clothes. We thought someone robbed us. We knew we hadn't left any food unsecured, and it didn't seem like an animal's work because the zippers were just pulled down like a person would do. Inside the tent, there were muddy prints all over the ground cover and tarp. If I didn't know better, I would have thought they were from a giant dog. Our bags had been opened and all contents had been removed and thrown around. All the food locked inside the cooler was missing and everything was covered in sand and mud. We were totally astonished, and then I noticed that growl I heard the night before. I was instantly terrified. I can't tell you how primal it sounds. My roommate and I rushed out and heard it coming towards us as it came from behind the trees. We both screamed when we saw this huge werewolf-like creature. It was obviously eating something and looked like a six or seven foot tall wolf, but had a man's torso. It had a long snout and sharp fangs, and when it howled it sounded like a human scream. It was facing sideways from us, so I couldn't really see its eyes. However, its back was kind of hunched over, and it had massive shoulders. It never looked at us. It finished what it ate and then turned away and disappeared into the trees. We were literally shaken from seeing that thing. We knew we had to live. Ave. We pulled everything out of the tent and shook it off as best we could. We threw everything in the trunk and raced out of there. We stopped at the ranger station, but it was after hours and nobody was around. We didn't know what to do and went home. I called them the next day to describe what we had seen. I have no idea if they took me seriously or if they thought we were just seeing things. I'm a pretty big skeptic of anything supernatural, and I have a firm belief that everything can be explained by science so I can't recall anything but one incident. It happened about 18 years ago. My wife's parents' house is a ranch house that is carved into the side of a hill. In their basement, they have a nice wood-burning stove and a big old comfy couch and some crocheted comforters that are amazing. It was Thanksgiving and we had just eaten. I didn't drink back then either. No meds to speak of perfectly healthy. It was my wife, her parents, and her two sisters. In classic form, I go downstairs after turkey, dressing and all matters of food. I curl up on the couch and take a nap. 
The wood burner was on, but closed so no noise the curtains down. There were the light blocking kind, so it was pitch black. Awesome, right? I am snuggled up in this blanket, and I slept for an hour and a half. Toasty. Just fantastic. I wake up. It, of course, is still pitch black. I stand up and make my move to the light switch. As I start walking there, I hear something. When I say hear something that isn't really a good description, it wasn't like in my ears with a direction. You know how you can tell where a sound is coming from? This sound was coming from inside my head, not my ears. And it was loud the voice which was neither man or woman whispered loudly. Haha, <laughs> 18 years later I am getting chills typing this. Juolin. My name obviously is John. I stood there in the dark. Dead still. About five foot from the light switch. Not scared. Confused. Okay, who the hell is down here? Where did that come from? Who was that? I didn't recognize the voice. I waited for it to repeat. I stood there for a minute with no light on. Nothing happened. So I walked the five foot to the light switch and flipped it on. Click. Looked around the basement. Nothing abnormal. I heard the rumbling of people walking around upstairs and talking lightly through the floor. So I put my pants back on and walked up the stairs. My wife, her parents, and two sisters are sitting at the table. So not even thinking, I said to them, Ha ha ha! Very funny whomever was downstairs. They all looked at me and you could tell the look was totally confused. My family is the jokesters. My wife's family is the serious people. My wife's mom says, John, we were all up here talking. Then it hit me. That voice wasn't them. Then I got serious chills because it didn't make sense, but I was such a skeptic, it couldn't be anything but them up to that point. Then my wife said something about how their cleaning lady had said she heard voices down in her basement a few years back, and the father also said the crazy aunt heard someone down there once. Then there was insane talk about Indian burial grounds and other stuff. I have never experienced that before. And in 18 years haven't again either. Just strange. They'll never figure it out, I am sure. So two stories, both from my dad, who is an avid outdoors man, hunter and fisherman. Early bow season, he went out scouting for whitetail. He walked around from dawn till about midday until he came to a large clearing. Inside of this clearing, he noticed what he claims to be hundreds of 55-gallon steel drums cut in half. So being a curious person, he decided to go look unknowingly stumbling into a large marijuana grow operation. According to him, he was like F this and just left. Second story is in rural Alabama once again hunting in a new area. Came to what looked like meadow with tall grass apparently he stumbled over what looked to be a cross. When we returned to camp an inquiry was made about this and apparently it was an old slave graveyard. It's just weird how the ghosts of history can sneak up on us in weird ways. Hello everyone, I'm not really sure if I should post this, mostly because I'm not really sure if what I'm experiencing is paranormal in any way, but yeah, I just need some kind of confirmation whether I'm just imagining things or not. Now, I also have to say that this post is going to be pretty long. These things have been happening for about a year or so, there's a lot to tell. I also have to state some things before I start telling you my story. I'm still in high school final year, so I still live with my parents in a relatively small apartment, two bedrooms, a kitchen, a bathroom, and a hall. 
The apartment building was built somewhere in the early 1990s, and my apartment was firstly inhabited by a small family before my parents moved in 2001. I don't have any mental illness and no record of any in my family, so what I've been seeing or hearing is most probably real. Now, let's go through my story. When I was young, I was extremely afraid of sleeping alone. Now, this is normal for any child, but my fear only disappeared when I was about 11 or 12. Now that I think about it, it might have been because of the sounds that I could hear at night. The building is relatively new, so there are no creaks or other sounds, even though the water can sometimes be heard circulating through the pipes. But ever since I was little, I could hear footsteps in the hall at night. Whenever I went to check, there was no apparent source. This startled me a bit in my early years, but as I grew older, I assumed they were from the neighbors above and kinda shook it off whenever I heard them. About a year ago, though, things really started to happen, and it all began with me having a sleep paralysis experience. That night, I woke up, but I couldn't move or speak, only look around my dark room, illuminated eerily by moonlight. At the foot of my bed stood a tall, dark figure. Not abnormally tall, somewhere close to my father's height at that time. I couldn't make out many details a part of it being humanoid, but it didn't speak or even move as a matter of fact. It just stared at me. I remember the feeling of just laying there, watching that figure stare back at me, but weirdly enough, I was completely calm. I wasn't confused, scared, horrified even, just calm. A month after that, I was on my PC, with the door to my bedroom closed. My desk with my computer is stationed on the other side of the door, so my webcam looks directly to it. That evening, I was on Discord with my friends and I had my camera turned on. We were just talking, chilling, laughing. Normal things. As I had my headphones on, I couldn't hear anything apart my friends' voices. Now, I only found this out about a couple of days later, but sometime during our call, my friends saw my door open by itself, but they thought it was my mother checking in on me. I didn't tell them that, but I knew for a fact that I was home alone at the moment. This really freaked me out, and for a few days I was terrified of being alone in the house. I thought someone broke in during that time. But there was nothing missing and the front door remained locked from the inside. The next few months were quiet. Very quiet. Nothing happened and the footsteps in the hall were gone. My theory about them was enhanced by the fact that the neighbors upstairs moved out and, to this day, no one lives in the apartment above. But then, things started going down. I started finding some of my things slightly moved. A pen from my desk was on the floor, a book in my bookshelf was now on my bed and things like that. I talked to my parents about those, but they said they didn't move anything. Then I would find a door to a cabinet or wardrobe randomly opened and left that way. Most of them also had nothing to do with my parents. This is when we started to jokingly say there was a ghost in the apartment, and we named it Mark. I know, it sounds stupid, but we chose to amuse ourselves instead of worrying. Something any person would find much more comforting, I believe. Then, we installed the light. As we sleep with the doors to our bedrooms open, it is inconvenient when someone turns on the hall light at night, when they go to the bathroom, mostly because the other are them woken up by it. So, to avoid stumbling into things while navigating through darkness, we installed a motion-detecting hall light. Simple, right? Kinda. Except of the fact that ever since we installed it, I barely sleep at night. The footsteps now return, even though there is absolutely no one above us and we live at the ground floor. But now, whenever I could hear footsteps, the light in the hall would turn on, as like detecting movement. But no one is there. 
I never managed to record it. So when I told my friends about it, they laughed at me. But when I had one of them stay overnight, their opinion changed within minutes. A week ago, I took a shower at about 2-3 a.m. Now, I might just be paranoid, but I can bet there's something there with me whenever I enter the bathroom. Watching. When I got out of the shower, I noticed scratch marks on my left arm. Two parallel lines and a perfect M or W. Now, as I said, most of this could be explained, like sleep paralysis hallucinations, footsteps creaks of the building, light faulty wiring, but for the sake of me, I can't explain the scratches, the moved items, the open doors, or even the presence I sometimes feel watches over me. me. My friends suggested I contact the spirit, but this is where I stop. I know for a fact how dangerous Ouija boards and seances can be, and I am not willing to invite something else into my home. And I also live in a country where religion isn't taken that seriously apart from the elders. Most priests don't even believe in God and our religion doesn't really cover ghosts or spirits. So there is no way to exercise or bless the house or something like that. So I ask you, a gathering of the most enthusiastic paranormal enjoyers and investigators, is this paranormal and what should I do about it? This incident occurred in 2004. I was working as a park ranger at Cuyahoga Valley National Park in North Central Ohio. I knew nothing about Ohio since I had grown up on the West Coast. I had actually volunteered for the 9 p.m. to 5 a.m. shift when it was available. I was a night owl at the time. One night around 3 a.m. I got this alert from one of the campsites saying that they couldn't find their friend. That part of that particular campground was out on a small peninsula. There were some coves and curved roads that made it easy to get turned around walking at night. It actually happened a lot. I got there and the friends seemed a little more scared than usual. They said that they had been searching for an hour already and there was no sign of their friend. They all seemed to be about 18 to 20 years old and smelled of alcohol. I didn't call law enforcement right away because often a drunk person would fall asleep on someone else's chair or picnic table, so we were usually able to find them soon enough. The missing friend had been sleeping in a tent by himself while the rest were still sitting around the fire. Apparently, he was too tired to stay awake anymore and had gone into his tent to lie down. They said around 2 a.m. they heard him rustling around in his tent. They went over to help him out and to see what was going on. He had walked into the nearby trees to relieve himself, but then he didn't come back out the trees. There shouldn't have been much of an area to get lost in. We all kept calling his cell phone. It rang, but there was no answer. I was concerned about drowning too, so I followed his footsteps in the mud which I was assuming were his. The footprints then stopped abruptly well before the water, still in the trees. I looked around and it didn't seem like he could have jumped anywhere and most of the trees around there were too big to be climbed. The footsteps just ended. They didn't backtrack or anything a little weird. We all kept searching until about 4 a.m. and then called it off. I told them let's just wait until morning. It was most likely that he had fallen asleep out of sight somewhere, so they all went back to their tents to try to get some sleep. I was way too wired to go home, so I actually kept at it. I was used to staying up all night anyway, and I just wanted to go sit down by the water and stay alert in case I noticed anything. On my way over there, I saw two things dangling down from a tree up ahead, and when I got close enough to see more clearly, I just freaked out. I started backing away. They were feet, but they were not human feet. I just let out this gasp, and then all of a sudden, this thing swooped out of the tree like a bat out of hell. 
All I could think was that it was some kind of a vulture or something. It was gigantic with probably a 10-foot wingspan, and it had flown down to the water's edge with these huge leathery wings. It was at least as tall as me and I'm six foot in height. It then turned around and it looked at me with these red glowing eyes. All of this happened in a matter of seconds. I realized it wasn't any kind of a bird for sure, and it didn't look like it had a beak. It didn't even look like it had a face. I just saw darkness in these red glowing eyes at that point. I became really concerned about the missing friend. I lost it and I just started yelling at the creature. It turned around and it ran along the shore until I couldn't see it anymore. I was sure we were about to find a dead body, but then I heard this rustling in the bushes and this half-naked person comes crawling out. It was the missing friend. When he was able to make sense, he said that he had gone to the lake to wash himself and the freaky winged thing had scared him half to death. He'd been under the bushes hiding and had passed out by then. I felt like I wasn't even in my right mind anymore. I took the guy back to the campsite, and I eventually got back to my office and checked out. I couldn't take it anymore. I had no clue how to even begin making sense of it all after that. I decided to switch to the day shift, and it ended up being a lot better for me. I eventually left the job at the park in 2008, moved back west, and now work for the state of California. So this time I wasn't intending on going a hike or camping or anything like that. I had gone to a state park near my home to just walk on one of the trails they had. So I'm walking along its broad daylight out maybe one in the afternoon when I noticed a side path going off the trail. Now if you have some experience hiking, you will know about so-called social trails, which are paths made by people to get to interesting sites and such. Well, I figured this was just a forming social trail and go off on it to check out what people are going to see. I don't walk that long or far. Far enough that I can't see the established trail anymore, but not so far I can't tell where I am in comparison to the trail, if that makes sense. Well, I come this clearing and in the middle of it is a tiny graveyard, maybe ten headstones in all. It was surrounded by a simple wooden fence and had an old rotted wood bench in the front of it. First off all, let me tell you about the feeling I got from this place. It was... sad. Just so very, very sad. Like you know how in Harry Potter they describe the presence of a Dementor being like all the happiness in the world was gone, and you could never feel happiness again. Well, that's what it felt like. I went from being in a fairly good mood to... Well, anyways, it was weird. Secondly, the gravestones were old. Some were crumbled and fallen, while others were worn and had plant life grown over them. Naturally, I went over and tried to find dates on the stones. Nine out of ten of the stone's words were worn away, but as luck would have it, the last stone wasn't completely worn. I couldn't read it, but as I felt it, I got the person's death date was July 13th, 1817. This graveyard was at least almost 200 years old, probably older due to the state of the other markers. After all of these observations, I decided to pay my respects and be on my way. I stayed a little longer seeing I figured these people hadn't had visitors in a while. There was an old bench that I sat on at the front of this graveyard and rested a moment talking to them for my own comfort, I guess. Some time passes and I figure I've bothered the dead's rest long enough so I leave. Find my way back to my trail and continue my walk. Suddenly, my phone goes off six, seven times in a row, and I check. I have seven new messages. My phone was acting like it had been off for the past ten minutes, and suddenly I had reconnected to it again. Weird, but whatever, probably a weird glitch or something. 
I finish my walk and stop by the visitor's center to buy something from the vending machine and talk to the park rangers there. I have become friends with one of them up there and asked him about the graveyard. He gave me this really confused look and said there isn't any graveyards within the park. I get a serious look and tell him to stop joking, and he just shrugs repeat there were no graveyards within the park. I then explained to him how I had spent a whole ten minutes sitting at this graveyard. He gets this really confused look this time and said I had been up at the trails for three hours, and he thought I had gone on the ten-mile trail he saw my car driving past earlier. Checking my phone, I was shocked to see it was 4 p.m. I had been at that graveyard for three hours, and it only felt like it was ten minutes. So it turns out my ranger friend has been keeping a logbook of weird experiences and happenings within the park and asked me to write mine. I did and went home. I don't know what happened, guys. Where was I? I'm a biologist, and I had the incredible opportunity to explore the vast wonders of the Amazon rainforest. It was an expedition like no other, surrounded by the lush greenery, diverse wildlife, and the constant excitement of identifying various species of plants and animals. Each day brought new discoveries, and I felt like a kid in a never-ending playground of scientific mysteries. As I ventured deeper into the bush, I relished in the joy of identifying trees, birds, monkeys, spiders, and so much more. Every find filled me with exhilaration and a sense of purpose. But then, one fateful day, everything changed. I was following a faint trail through the dense undergrowth when I noticed something peculiar moving in the shadows. Curiosity took over and I moved cautiously closer, my eyes widening in disbelief as I laid eyes on the strangest creature I'd ever encountered. It was like an alien from another world, a surreal manifestation of the Lovecraftian horrors I'd read about in my spare time. This creature defied any classification. It seemed to possess attributes from multiple phyla and species, stitched together in a bizarre and discomforting amalgamation. Its form was utterly incomprehensible, and my brain struggled to process what my eyes were witnessing. It was as if I had stumbled upon a secret of nature that had never been meant for human eyes. The encounter left me speechless, unable to find the right words to describe this unearthly entity. It was beyond any scientific understanding or known taxonomy. I felt a mix of wonder fear, and reverence for this enigmatic being that seemed to defy the laws of nature. As a biologist, I had dedicated my life to unraveling the mysteries of the natural world. But this encounter had humbled me beyond measure. It was a reminder that no matter how much we know, the universe is bound to be more vast, complex, and unknowable than we can ever comprehend. For days, I found myself haunted by the image of that creature, the indescribable beast that had forever altered my perception of the world. I couldn't help but wonder if I was the only human who had laid eyes upon it, or if someone else in some obscure corner of academia had stumbled upon a similar enigma. As I continued my journey through the Amazon, my heart pounded with both trepidation and excitement. The Lovecraftian horror I had encountered had shaken the foundations of my understanding, but it had also ignited a spark of unyielding curiosity. Despite my inability to grasp its nature, I knew that this encounter had changed me as a biologist, as a person. In the heart of the Amazon, I learned that there will always be mysteries lurking in the shadows, waiting for the intrepid souls who dare to explore. The discomforting unknown now beckoned me, and I couldn't help but embrace the awe-inspiring grandeur of a world far more vast and inexplicable than I had ever dreamed.
My time slip story happened in the summer of 1987. One night, I experienced something that enabled me to see the world through someone else's eyes for no longer than a minute. It scared me senseless at the time, and I have no explanation for the events all those years ago. The backstory is this. My then-girlfriend, we'll call her Helen, lived in a big, former vicarage built around the 1800s in a small village in Yorkshire, UK, some miles from my hometown. Her father was a wealthy guy who worked for the government. He bought the house for the family to live in a couple of years earlier and renovated it to bring it back to its former glory. One August weekend, Helen had the house to herself. Her brother and parents were somewhere else. She decided to have a small party. I was instructed to bring my buddy Tim along. It seemed that one of her friends had a thing for him and really wanted to meet him. So the party was me and Tim, my girlfriend and three of her mates from university, one of whom was the reason my friend was reluctantly set up to meet. Okay, so the scene has been set. We turn up with a large quantity of beer and an attitude. I did my part by bringing Tim along to meet the girl. However, he then got drunk and embarrassed, and failed to fulfill his expected role of sweeping this very pretty, but rather dull young woman off her feet. He wasn't concerned about romance and enjoyed himself in his own way. We were twenty and that night beer and silliness took over. It was a night I will never forget. By midnight, the girls were all in Helen's bedroom doing what girls do when things happen. They were ganging up together and probably having a group anti-men therapy session. At this point, Tim and I were ready to find somewhere to fall into deep sleep. We decided to worry about facing these disappointed women in the morning. I wasn't drunk, but I drunk enough beer and didn't want to drive us home. I suggested we find a bed somewhere in this sprawling, rambling old house. Now imagine a house with maybe 12 rooms upstairs. I knew the door to the bathroom and to Helen's room, but every other door was a mystery. Tim and I walked to the end of a passage and pushed open a door. The room was empty except for two small ancient iron beds squeezed against the wall and a few packing crates. There was no carpet on the floor and no other furniture. It was like a small storeroom, but there were beds and we weren't too fussy. In our sleepy state, we just fell asleep. The next thing I knew, I was sitting up in bed, looking out of the window opposite. The window had five bars, upright bars like an old jail. The sun was streaming into the room and it was blinding me. Outside the window, I could clearly see the branches of a large tree as they moved in what seemed to be a very windy morning. The next thing I realized was that the room was filled with furniture, very old-fashioned furniture. It seemed like a nursery with a rocking horse in the corner, but there was no ceiling electric light. Not sure why I looked up, but I did and remembered there was no light. As I tried to make sense of where I was, I could hear people moving outside the room. I could also hear the distinct sound of china cups and plates chinking as people carried and served food. I tried to get out of my bed, but I was totally paralyzed from the waist down. My legs wouldn't move, and I panicked. I looked to my right, and there was no other bed, snoring Tim. I was terrified. A door opened and a young woman walked into the room. She started speaking to me, but no sound came out of her mouth. She was dressed like a servant from a period movie. There was no kindness or smiles. She came in and spoke to me, no idea what she said, and then left. At this point, I was shaking like a leaf and trying to figure out what to do next. I remember thinking I should check the time. I looked down at my watch and everything went dark. I could hear snoring and my digital watch showed it was 3.10 a.m. Wherever I had been, I was back where I needed to be. I leapt out of bed, felt for the light switch and turned it on. 
Everything was 1987 again, confirmed by the language from Tim who was woken up by the light. The rest of the night passed without incident. First thing in the morning, I was awoken again by the sunlight streaming through the window. This time, there were no bars on the window, no tree limbs bending the shafts of light that streamed into the room. It was just an ordinary window. I went downstairs, leaving Tim to sleep. Once the girls had poured me a coffee, I took it outside into the large garden. I needed to see where the tree had gone, the tree that I saw so clearly a few hours before. Helen and her friends followed me outside and I explained what had happened, that I had seen a huge old tree and bars on the window. The tree was gone. No tree stump anywhere near the building. I saw the small window of our room, and then we saw a rather hungover Tim smiling weakly, waving from the same window, who had heard us talking outside in the garden. The story might have ended there. I believe that for a short period of maybe 30-45 seconds, I swapped places with a former occupant of that room. At a time when there was no electric light, bars on the window, an old tree beyond the window, and a rather unhappy servant whose voice was on mute. After I told Helen everything, she went quiet and said nothing. Have you ever been to my dad's study? I answered that I had not. She said, follow me, and we walked into a downstairs room where her dad worked and had his den. He collected documents and photographs from the house's history to help him and the architect renovate it to its former glory. She pointed out a set of five old sepia photographs, which were framed on the wall. The earliest dated from about 180 through maybe 10 years judging by the ages of the children of presumably the same family. It shows the resident, the local vicar, sitting in the garden with his wife and family. He was dressed in Victorian dresses, sailor suits, and starched collars. There were, I think, eight children and one was in an ancient wheelchair. They were all arranged in front of a huge oak tree behind which the window of our time slip room clearly had bars. The boy in the wheelchair looked about 12 and was clearly very disabled. He didn't appear in any of the later photos on the wall. So that's my story. People will say, yeah, the guy had been drinking I had but no amount of German beer and Marlboros. There were no drugs involved would cause me to experience what I did. The weirdest thing about the whole event was that it felt hyper-real, like everything was turned up on a TV contrast, brightness, color, everything except the volume on the grumpy servant. I will never forget how terrifying the whole thing was to me. I haven't had anything like that happen to me again, nor do I want to repeat it. My experience left me fascinated by the time slip stories that I know you enjoy. However, I had a genuine wish to never again pass through whatever dimensional or time-space curtain exists, and it really does exist. I hope that by posting this, maybe another fellow officer will read this and open up about some of the more sensitive things in their own life. I was partnered with a fellow officer who would always tell me these stories about how he was seeing this thing all over the place. He said he saw it by the 7-Eleven, and then again by an abandoned house that used to be a meth house. Finally, this thing had apparently followed him outside of town into the swamps and forest. I never once thought he was making any of it up, because you know he's my partner. That's not his style. He's very serious, but I begin to notice things along with him as well. At first, it wasn't anything major, but just odd little things that you'd see for a split second. Usually when you're driving through unpopulated rural areas at nighttime. Other officers had told me that they too had been seeing something strange around their patrol zones, but were hesitant on speaking up. 
One night, my partner said that he was going to follow whatever it was into the forest. I was already nervous about the area of Florida because people have talked about seeing some really weird things there in the years. I tried talking him out of it, but he insisted on going anyway, so I went with him. A few blocks away from the edge of the forest, I told him to stop and park by a remote two-story house on a street corner. He parked right next to it, cut his engine off, and we sat there in silence for roughly three to five minutes. Then, we heard this blood-curdling roar coming from nearby in the marshes, and my partner looks behind us and screams, Oh no! Then, he turns the engine back on and peels out of there like a bat out of hell. I never did find out what he saw behind us. I didn't find out until after he'd retired that he'd seen what was making those roars, and he claims it wasn't human. I hope the department never puts him in a position to have to shoot one. I can only assume they're big, tough, and mean, but again, if there were anything like this when he saw it, who knows how much good a gun would. Do. If this is maybe something like a skunk ape, I'm also willing to bet that all the strange creatures out there are smart enough to not attack him after what he must have done. That's all for now, folks. But if you want to discuss this in private, go ahead and send me a PM. I'd be more than happy and willing to discuss this. This story was shared to me probably a little over a year ago by a U.S. Border Control agent who obviously wanted to remain anonymous. Some of the stories he shared with me about working on the southern border were interesting, including some Bigfoot-type encounters. But the first incident that he experienced was with a dogman. This occurred when he was still training for his job. It really shook him because he had never seen anything like it before. So, he drove around with a senior co-worker, a field training officer. They were in their Ford truck driving around, showing him the checkpoints and hotspots where they usually find people illegally crossing the border. I believe he said he was working 10 or 12 hour shifts this was at the Arizona-California border where it intersects with the Mexico border. One night, while he was still fairly new, he actually had a cold and wasn't feeling very well. They were traveling on a dirt road which was part of their normal routine. They didn't see any signs of people which they thought was a little odd because he says he always sees trash, water bottles, or clothes or something out there. They got to the turnaround and flipped on their spotlights. They didn't really see anything, and as they're turning around the headlights and the spotlights illuminated something in the distance, his training officer looked over and said, Oh, that's probably just a wild animal. We should we go take a look? They get closer, and I guess at this point the terrain got kind of rough. He slowly drove forward. While observing this animal, they could tell that it had dark black fur, but weren't sure what they were looking at. Maybe we should just leave it alone. He was really urging the training officer that they should get out there. His response was, no, we need to go check it out. Then it clicked with the training officer that something wasn't right. It looked like a bear hunched over while eating something. They got within 30 yards of it, a good distance, but still close enough that they could see what was going on. At this point, they flipped on another set of bright lights from the light bar on the cab roof. This creature lit up, then it stood up. He thought it was a giant man with a fur coat. But as it turned around, he noticed that it had this dog's head, like a wolf's head. It was all black and you could see the eyes. The eye shine was reflecting an amber tint. It was very muscular and had broad shoulders. It was way too huge to be a dog or wolf. Then it stood up on its back legs. He immediately stopped the truck as they watched this upright canine looking at them. After several seconds, 
This dogman eventually took a step towards them. Then it took another step, and it was closing distance. It wasn't walking fast, but its strides were so huge, and it was getting closer and closer. He threw the truck into reverse. The dogman opened its mouth a little bit and hunched over, like it was sizing up prey. He quickly turned the truck around and drove away from the creature. He looks in the rearview mirror. He could still see the dogman illuminated by the red rear lights. He said he had never seen anything like that. It scared the crap out of him. They directly drove back to the station. His training officer said that it was just big dog, but don't talk about it with anyone. They didn't mention it in their nightly report. Occasionally, you'll pick up migrants that will talk about the Lobos or the Big Hairy Man and other strange stuff in the desert. Me and my girlfriend at the time went camping deep in the Everglades. We took a dirt road off the Tamiami Trail at the 40-mile bend and headed straight south into Big Cypress Preserve. After passing a few strange private properties, an old Volkswagen full of mannequins, 15-foot fences with no trespassing sign, etc. We found a campsite that was part of the preserve about 30 minutes later. We set up camp and my girlfriend points to a tiny overgrown trail leading back into the woods. I grab my machete, start clearing the path and start hiking along this old trail with her right behind me. We probably blaze that trail for about a mile and a half before she stops me. I look up and there's this old double wide trailer a few yards off the trail up ahead. The walls and floor had mostly fallen through and was totally destroyed. After looking through it, we kept walking. I'm looking down hacking away with my machete and she stops me again. There was this small cinder block shelter off the trail to the right. By this point, I'm getting creeped out trying to figure out the logistics of someone building a shelter of cinder block or bringing a double wide that deep into the woods. We were miles from any roads, and we are in a swamp, it just didn't make sense. We kept walking, see more shelters, and all of a sudden the woods open up into this clearing. The shelters we had been seeing surrounded the clearing making a circle, and there were old 70s style clothes on the ground, old bottles and cans, and different small tools in each shelter. We turned around, looked up and saw these two H-beams raised on series of pillars, making a railroad track that traveled above the brush from way off in the distance and ended at this site. Thoroughly creeped out, we started to circle back toward our campsite before I hear my girlfriend call me over. There was a single-engine airplane with bullet holes down the side turned over in the brush. We checked out the plane and got the hell out. About two years ago now, a friend and I were driving around some dirt roads in rural Georgia. Miles out from any civilization, we were just driving because he had plenty of gas and we were bored. Anyways, we turn off the road we were on to check another road. And as soon as we're on it, standing right in the middle of the road, dead ahead of us, about five yards from the gate is a massive white cat. We're talking mountain lion size, but fluffy like a bobcat and snow white. Of course, my reaction was to ask him if he was seeing what I was seeing, because what I was seeing was a giant albino bobcat. After about five whole minutes of making sure we were on the same page and not hallucinating, during which it just sat there, naturally we pull a little closer to get a better look at it. The thing just stared at us, so we go to get out of the truck. As soon as we opened the doors, it trotted to the other side of the gate and stood there continuing to watch us. Like it knew we were completely foiled by that gate, 
We still go out at those woods a few times a year to try and find it again, but it has been to no avail since. Still, an amazing experience we'll never forget, though. Thanks for listening yet another episode of Nightmare Hours. If you love our stories, do hit that subscribe button. Good night, folks, and see you tomorrow at the same time.